technical seminar that has to do with the dolphins criteria to be considered when a captive facility closes. As you can see, quite a long title. The seminar will be taking place in Catalan and English with simultaneous interpreting to both languages. And next, we're going to be listening to Mr. Frederic Ximeno of the Environmental and Ecology Commission of the Barcelona City Council, Mr. Manuel Gasso, Director of Submon, and Mr. Cito Alarcón, Director of the Barcelona Zoo, will each one be opening the seminar. You have the floor. Good morning, everybody. You are very, very welcome. And as you know, December 2016, after a full process of reflecting and thinking at the Barcelona Zoo, a number of representatives of the Barcelona City Council decided that uh, dolphins should not remain at the zoo, and this then is a decision that has been made, it was made uh, last year, and it is a clear decision that we have to work on. It's very, very important for us to actually make a good decision as well regarding as to where our dolphins should go. Dolphins that we don't want at the Barcelona Zoo, we don't want our dolphins to be in captivity. So, first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers who have come. We have mm, high levels of uh, expectations regarding them. We know that they're going to help us to make very good decisions. These dolphins are and will forever be our responsibility during their lives. And it's very important then that we can make the best well-informed decisions. And that means good information. And this, in, in fact, has been what, what we've been trying to do at the Barcelona Zoo since the moment we made the decision. With the help of so many institutions, we have visited places, we have spoken to people. Some of them are here today, we are happy to say. And we've been talking about projects and possibilities. So we have also analyzed the situation of the dolphins, the team at the zoo, of course, all the carers at the zoo um, realize what the, what the issue is. So we have a whole a spectrum of uh, references to make decisions, but we were very interested in, in finding out more and in, uh, in a collective way and from different standpoints to know what the recommendations of the world of science are regarding our dolphins. So whatever is said and thought during these days here is important for the Barcelona City Council in order to make a well-informed decision, knowing what the opinion is of the world of science. That's the first um, item. We want what is best for our dolphins. The second point which we are going to be talking about during this seminar is that after this decision of the Barcelona City Council about the dolphins, and well, other countries have made the same decision as we know, France, for example, and other countries have already made that decision, the UK many, many years ago, Finland quite recently, so many countries are deciding not to have captive dolphins. And that's why we also thought it would be a good idea to invite to Barcelona this very interesting group of, of dolphin experts of different countries, because we want to make this into a sort of message. We are interested in our dolphins, we want to make sure we, we decide what is best for them. But we wanted to count on other people's, other experts' opinions, and also make sure that this is, is heard about and talked about. So we do hope that from this workshop, the new ideas and criteria make it easier for the countries maybe to make decisions about their dolphins. And then third point to aim of this workshop, and very important for the Barcelona City Council, is, uh, well, exactly what to do and how to go about actions with free dolphins, the ones that swim uh, in our sea. I mean, Barcelona is a Mediterranean city, and dolphins need many things, and the city itself too. We want life to continue with us, and as a Mediterranean city committed to our environment and committed to our sea, we want to know what it is that we have to do in order to improve conditions 
and in order to make sure that our dolphins, well, they're not ours, of course, they are free dolphins, but they are the dolphins that swim in our waters and we feel responsible for their, for their well-being and for nature to, to function for them. So then these are the three bullet points, so to speak, the subject areas of this workshop. And on behalf of the City Council of Barcelona, I want to say thank you again to the speakers, the organizers, and well, very simply say, let us not lose focus, and I want to insist on this. We should not lose focus. The decision has been made. Our dolphins are going to be free. We do not want our dolphins at the zoo because we don't want them to be captive animals. And what we are really asking for now is what to do after the decision. What's the best way to implement this decision? What criteria should we bear in mind, both technically and specifically for our dolphins? That's all. That's all from me. I think it's great that in Barcelona we have all these incredible people visiting us. The idea is that on the basis of what you will contribute, plus all the work that's been done already, analysis, uh, spaces, information about different areas, reports, from a number of institutions, well, we will be defining well criteria for the best decision that has to be made fast, as you know. We have a commitment, and that is that we should find a destination for these dolphins pretty immediately. And we have to make sure we define this. That's all from me. Uh, we are high expectancies on your guidelines. Uh, uh, and we would like you can do a good work for our city and also for for the the the, 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 the guidelines for uh, captivity dolphins and also for free dolphins in the Mediterranean. Thank you very much. Good job, and uh, we hope you can give us a, a good guidelines to to make the best decision possible. Sabem que, uh, we know that this is a decision, and it's important to say this before I, I, I end my presentation. There's a long-term decision, as I said, because these dolphins will be the responsibility of the Barcelona City Council and of the Barcelona citizens, and they will be a responsibility for their whole lives. But the decision has to be made now, because it's now when they're going to leave the zoo, so we have to find a good destination, and there's a twofold consideration, isn't there? So I would kindly ask you all in the work that will be carried out these days to always have this twofold goal in mind, yeah? What should we do um, now for the captive dolphins um, in the long run? Maybe it's the same thing. You are the experts, but maybe they are different things, yeah? I mean, where to place them now and how to look after the ones that are free. We have these six dolphins that we know very well. We know their personalities and their features and traits and we'll think about them. And we'll have to see for each one what the best solution is. It might be a joint or individual solution. We don't know. It's what we will see these days. We are not experts, but we've been making decisions. Thank you very, very much. I also want to say thank you to those of you who came, especially from abroad. It is very good to listen to the scientific opinions interesting, it helps to define criteria, and this is what we want to have, good criteria in order to make the best decisions for the dolphins in Barcelona. Thank you. Thank you very much, and the floor goes now to Manel Gato. Thank you, Frederic. On our behalf, I can say that from Submon, and let me explain, Submon is a team of professionals working for conservation of uh, marine diversity. And for quite a long time, we are working on a number of projects that should be helping us change the way in which uh, society relates to the sea in general and with marine protected species more specifically. And in this context, when we talked to the Barcelona City Council, they said, listen, we should organize a workshop at two levels. We'll, we'll talk about that later and try and see other positions from a more technical scientific standpoint that would help not only Barcelona, but also other organizations and companies that at a given point in time decided they didn't want to have captive dolphins in, in their facilities. And this is the, the aim of the workshop. So 
we have work to do, but ours is a commitment. We, we at Submon have been working already on, on the guidelines for the best decision-making process. But I have to highlight this. This is not a discussion about captivity for dolphins, yes or no. As has been said, the decision was made, and we know that because of ethical, political, economical reasons and because the facilities of the zoo are not working as they should. I mean, the decision was made to make sure that we don't have captive dolphins. So now we, we have to think what to do with these captive dolphins. Then on the other hand, the Barcelona City Council, because of urban fauna, uh, well, decided to do something because animal life is growing in Barcelona, both, uh, well, uh, we know about it in mountain areas, but it's also growing in the sea areas. And we thought, as we do have captive dolphins, but we have a resident uh, free dolphin uh, group in our seas, well, then we decided we would do something about them. Because remember, 1992, Barcelona recovered its beach. So now we want to recover our sea. And that is one of the ideas we want to work with, with you all here. So then those are the three main blocks of the conference. The first one has to do with people who work more directly with local, very um, um, coastal dolphin populations that have been working with these populations with these parts for years. They, they can actually um, have behavior studies, they know about problems and issues, so they can give us a very good definition of the relationship of these great uh, sea mammals, and they can tell us about the scientific side. Another is a section that uh, has to do with people working with animals in captivity. In this second block, we'll see types of facilities, whether they're correct or not, the wellness indices that we have to analyze in order to know whether our dolphins are well or not, and then talk about it from a technical point of view. And then third block would be, I don't know, the alternative. I mean, when these dolphins cannot be in the place they are supposed to be, where do they go? And those are different places, and we want to see then what the different alternatives are and the different attitudes and opinions that can be worked on regarding this. Seeing the list of people participating, both speakers and attendants, I see there's quite a mishmash of different wills and opinions. And that is good. This is the best space to understand that although there might be attitudes and positions that are quite different, I'm very sure we can find common interests. This is really one of the main ideas of this workshop, yeah? Because maybe positions won't change, but I do think we'll find common interests. Most of us are here because we want animals to be well. And this is what Submon wanted to work on. It's not been easy to organize this workshop. Uh, we didn't have much time. I would like to thank also the people who said yes as of the month of July. It was a short notice. It's not been easy either because there's a huge group of people. That is the European uh, Association of, of Aquaria. They, they, they thought they had already contributed enough information, and they decided not to participate in the workshop, saying our position is very clear. We stated it before. So, uh, well, they will be missing, and it's more, we'll be talking more about well-being and welfare from another standpoint, because those are not there. Then the last, well, on Friday, we have a closed session with the speakers, and then we will be working on those guidelines that can be useful uh, to the Barcelona City Council or other political groups interested in order to see how to prepare and implement this decision, stating that you don't want captive animals any longer. If we were to go to UCN, when something like this has to be done, animals uh, in captivity they have to be made free, what do you do? Do you replace them? Do you prepare them for being free? There are three main axes uh, or three main options possible. We've been working on all this in such a way that the, the main aim of the guidelines will be a participatory process, a well-organized debate or discussion session between the speakers, because during the preparation of the workshop, they've been writing to us and telling us and giving us key criteria about the specific question that was, according to you as an expert, what would the key criteria be? Please define five. The five key criteria in order to decide what to do with an animal. An animal, because, I mean, we, we sometimes have to talk about individuals, sometimes about populations, sometimes about species. Here we're talking about individuals. So what to do when one decides one is not going to have this animal captive any longer? 
So then the guidelines have a specific uh, format. There is a, a committee deciding and agreeing towards a final decision that's very possibly political. And of course, the technical um, expertise comes first. There are, well, opinions and things going for these criteria or against, we want to talk about it. Nothing has been decided as a final decision. But the idea really is that once we have those guidelines well defined, thanks to this workshop, we can share this with the people and with uh, politicians. And well, in this way, we will be building solid options. It was in a very short period of time. Uh, you have to prepare your talk, you have to uh, answer our questions, and we have to fly, uh, book your flights. There are some people coming from, from abroad, there are people coming from the States, and also I also want to thank people that will be in contact with us, will be doing the representation by, by Skype. Uh, it's a pleasure for, for us to have you in, in this city, and, and well, we, we think that it will be good for, for all of us, and we will improve a lot our work with, with, all, with all of you. Thank you as well to the people participating. 120 attendants. I suppose some people will come later tomorrow, but that's been good because it's been a pretty last minute Congress organization. That means that people are interested in dolphins. And we know that uh, Eric Hoyt, the, the speaker, is well known by everybody, and he's going to give us the right dimension, saying we're talking of dolphins, so uh, dolphins in the wild. And this is an idea that people have to start thinking about. Thank you as well to the Pompeo Fabra University for coordinating everything so well, for helping us out with this, uh, with the facility and for logistic help. And once again, thank you to the City Council of Barcelona for having given us a chance to organize uh, a better workshop than the one we initially thought of. We have um, had total freedom to contact those persons we thought were essential, and they've made it very easy for us. We said we want a workshop where speakers come to tell us about what they work with and what they know and what they do, but not really what they feel or what they think. Yeah, And this is something that means that we're all going to be very comfortable because object we're going to be objective and we're going to be talking about our work. Thank you. Thank you, Manel. Now, the floor goes to Cito Alarcón, director of the Barcelona Zoo. Thank you very much indeed. It's a huge satisfaction for me to be here for two reasons. First of all, because I'm not working at the zoo, and this makes it possible for me to communicate with people who, as was the case when I was young, who actually work on science that has to do with cetaceans. I belong to Alex Aguilar's group, and with other people who are here in the room, we have followed cetaceans. Cetaceans, I have to see in my case, I was, I love them because I'm like a cetacean myself. And second, because I've also been um, pretty much a fan of physiology, of immersion, of diving. And for me, the adaptive uh, ability of these animals was just incredible. I mean, they really do much better than we do as divers uh, with you know, bottles and such. The fact of you being here makes me so happy. And all I can do is repeat what has been said already at the panel. The fact of you being here is a twofold satisfaction for me, first of all, because we are going to be tackling about something that in the last year, because remember, I've been a director of the zoo for one month and really new as, as a zoo director, but for more than a year already, a lot has been, maybe more than a year, but a lot has been published in the media about dolphins, and I am so happy, so happy that this is talked about from a scientific standpoint. And second, the commission from the politicians and, uh, well, and from the people at the Barcelona Council, well, have commissioned us to go for a new zoo for a new model of a zoo in Barcelona. That's what we've been commissioned with. And the zoo here in Citadella, the issue of dolphins really concerned us because, as you know, the zoo in Barcelona is very small. It's a very urban zoo. Never mind the whole issue of whether dolphins in captivity or dolphins free, but I mean, it just didn't fit in with the future of the principles of our zoo model, which uh, wants to be a conservation 
Migration and Biodiversity Center. So the issue of the dolphins, we believe, was very, very complex. But I'm so happy that, in fact, what uh, could have been an issue is going to now become just the subject of cetaceans and dolphins seen from the scientific standpoint and talking about them not being in captivity. I've also been very much involved, and this Manel said, involved in uh, getting our sea, our Mediterranean, back. In the year 2003, we started already on the project of artificial coastline areas for the recovery of some species. We still have other areas to work on. And one of the things we want to do in our strategic plan is that despite the fact that we don't have uh, marine mammals, we will be very much linked to the conservation and preservation of our coastal areas because from time to time we do get cetaceans swimming along, although they don't stay, but there's been a great recovery of the seabed. And let me tell you, about 20 years ago, the only visitor of uh, our area was Capitella capitata, a small worm. But now the biodiversity is much more splendid than it was, and this makes us very happy, and it means as well that in political parlance, well, it means we have a bioindicator saying that that the coast, and when I say Barcelona, I mean, of course, Barcelona and neighboring locations, but it means that all this area has a tropic uh, impact. And this impact has existed for more than 10 or 15 years, thanks to the implementation of a good plan that wanted to eliminate a number of bad environmental practices. So we're very happy. And I can guarantee you all that here at the zoo, we're going to pay a lot of attention to the results of this work. Shop. I guess, well, I do know on Saturday you're going to be visiting the zoo. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this weekend it might rain, I'm sorry to say, and if it rains, well, mm, you, well, you're going to kind of work better because you'll concentrate, you won't kind of have a neural holiday, uh, and I'm sad about that, but in any case, uh, sunshine is not necessary because we'll be there, we'll all be with you, and we'll be very happy to receive you. And to talk not only about dolphins, but about other things, it's essentially you came precisely at the point in which we are thinking about all these changes in this future model. So welcome. I hope this is really a very, very good and fruitful workshop. And, uh, well, it will rain tomorrow and after tomorrow. What can I do? I've been to many workshops throughout the world. And it wasn't very pleasant when the weather was bad, but what can you do? Thank you. Thank you, Sito. Manel wanted to add a detail, I believe. Yeah, um, yes, I forgot precisely because I wanted everything to be so perfect. I want to take advantage of the fact that we all hear when I mentioned the importance that the Barcelona City Council gives to its local fauna. Well, yes, indeed, our sea area has improved, but we have a suggestion from Submont. And it's a suggestion that has the, the aid of the Barcelona City Council. In 2019, here in Barcelona, we will have the Second World Conference on marine mammals, and it will take place here in Barcelona. And that will be the second time in which all American scientists of the Society of Marine Mm, animals and other institutions will unite for a five-day conference. And we think it really is very good, a very good initiative for and from Barcelona. So I wanted to tell you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, we are very, very happy. Happy indeed that this uh, international workshop takes place here in 2019. It will be the chance to have even more scientists involved in conservation of marine mammals. Let me end by saying also thank you to Submon for having helped so much, and thank you to the zoo, to the people from the zoo, to the Pompeu Fabra University for hosting us. And, well, yes, we are part and parcel of a process in which we are rethinking our zoo model. It's been a very active process uh, that had its tensions as well. 
it wasn't always unanimous. That, that's healthy. It's good that any process has its controversies. So as I say, we are moving to this new model of a zoo. And we are moving, as we know, to the fact of animals in captivity being part of the past, in a way. Let me tell you as well that there is a citizenship initiative that has been fostered by the City Council in Barcelona to further increase the awareness of this initiative. We have more than 15,000 people signing for this change, and that means that it's a full participation process that the Barcelona City Council has led. It makes us happy happy in the words that Manel was speaking. It's an aspect that we're interested in. It is something that we believe has to be discussed. It has a lot to do with the city, and the city council is involved in this change. It's good that Sito and his team help us out, and it's a way that we will all follow together. There is no going back now, so let us focus today on defining the guidelines for a good decision. We know it's a complex decision that was made, and now we have to work to do what is best for our animals. As I said before, good work, and I'm sure that your reflections and your work will help us do the best for our dolphins. Thank you. issues regarding the presentations. You've got Wi-Fi because in, uh, in the basement where we are, there's no coverage. And the Wi-Fi is posted somewhere on the walls, on the side walls. There's a hashtag too for this workshop, which is BCN Tourships. You can tweet away or post things on Facebook. More technical stuff, I mean, housekeeping stuff. Um, restrooms are on the way out to the right. We'll close the doors during the presentations, so you'll be able to go out and come back in between presentations. It's a matter of being respectful with the presenters. And we've been recommended um, to pay attention to your belongings, laptops, mobile phones, bags. Well, this is a public space. Anyone can come in. So just uh, beware of your belongings. I would like to announce to a couple of changes of the agenda this afternoon Baltimore's zoo will be with us through a Skype call. This will be at 5 p.m. this afternoon. It will be well, an additional 20 minutes because I think it's 11 a.m. in Baltimore. And we need to apologize on behalf of Mariano Domingo. His presentation will be delivered anyway. Manel will tell you later um, why he can't make it. But well, we apologize in advance on his behalf. I would like to thank the volunteers who will be helping out throughout the workshop. So anything you need, they can assist you. They are dressed in black, and they are called Maria. You can find them at the back of the room. Maria, Chloe, Anna, Alicia, and Leticia. So thank you to all of them. And now we will hand it over to our guest speaker, who is Eric Hoyt. But first, Manel Gasso will introduce him. Gracias a todos por asistir, por su curar.
Sí. Perdó. I... Uh, també dir que els temps eh, de les xerrades intentarem que siguin això és més de cara als ponents que siguin molt, time that has been molt estrictes vale? tenim eh, so we need to be stringent with that we've got vale? this poster el, el, here <laughs> and we'll be <laughs> using it <laughs> just to let you know this is a message for the speakers Bé, doncs, com us ha, com us ha dit la, la Carla, eh, As Carla volíem començar said, el workshop amb una sessió. We wanted to start the workshop with... You've got de, de més de 20 minuts en aquesta sessió inaugural i estem with a more than 20 minute session for this opening session and we're very happy that he accepted the invitation to come and deliver an overview presentation. Eric Hoyt has devoted his entire professional career to the study and conservation of different marine species. It's impossible to Google orca or killer whale and do not come across Eric, uh, Eric's name because he has always spearhead the um, conservation of cetaceans, most um, whale watching protocols and guidelines, things being used by the IUCN and the International Whaling Commission are signed by him or um, advised and uh, uh, by him, so he's always there. His productivity regarding publications and guidelines is very high and he also raises awareness. I'm convinced that those of you who have a certain age and if you go back to the first dolphins and whales uh, guidelines, you'll see that they are signed by Eric. And for a year, he has been involved in a world program to detect the most important uh, marine mammal regions. So he's basically traveling around the world to meet with other researchers and see which are the, the hot spots that need to be protected. So he studies the animals and then he has really made a bet to protect, um, to make protected uh, marine areas. Well, that's about it from my part. I'm sure it will be a very interesting presentation and we will enjoy it. Thank you very much, Eric. Is that all right? Yeah, that's much better. <laughs> okay. Um, so I want to first. I want to thank Manel, uh, Carla, Alba, and Submon for uh, inviting me to speak here, and uh, in Barcelona, and to thank the Barcelona Zoo and the university for hosting us, and um, uh, and the Barcelona City Hall for supporting this whole initiative. And I'm, I'm going to talk uh, about how whales and dolphins have really driven a lot of marine research and conservation. Um, I'm going to uh, give a brief introduction as to how research and conservation have grown from both captivity and in the wild studies. And then I'll present an overview of where I think we are now and the great opportunities that I see in terms of protecting their habitat, not only in national waters, but in, on the high seas. Uh, there are huge challenges uh, ahead that we have uh, that relate not just to saving whales and dolphins and for humans adopting a healthy attitude toward them, but for thinking about what kind of ocean, what kind of planet that we want to live on uh, in the coming decades. And I, I'm going to... Um, um, I'm going to go first to killer whales uh, because that's my, my uh, experience and, my, and um, my, my first love. Killer whales are dolphins, however, and they actually share a lot of similar things with bottlenose dolphins in terms of um, the fact that they were captured and have had this period in captivity and many of the things that we've learned about um, 
uh, about captivity and also, you know, the pluses and minuses uh, came also with killer whales along with bottlenose dolphins. So I want to take you back um, to try to appreciate the, um, the situation in the wild uh, and how that kind of combines with some of the problems that we see uh, developing from a capture industry and captivity and, and how that all sort of got started. And uh, so I'll take you back to this critical time for whales and dolphins in the Northwest United States and West Coast Canada waters. In the late 1960s and 70s, there were millions of people uh, in North America and worldwide that were starting to meet killer whales and bottlenose dolphins for the first time in aquariums, lining up to see them, so excited. And th this is really before whale watching got started. Um, whale watching uh, was a really small industry at that time in California, so really the only way to see them, uh, unless you got lucky seeing them along a coast or you went to California, was to see them in captivity. Um, and of course, people got very excited. Dolphins have big smiles on their faces, so people thought that they were always happy. And even the dangerous killer whale, so-called dangerous killer whale, was, was turned into this sort of lovable sea panda uh, in the way that they were presented to the public. So around the same time uh, as the, as the uh, kept uh, the captivity industry was, the, the aquariums were really flourishing. Uh, in 1973, a small group of us started spending our summers with killer whales off the northeast, um, northeastern Vancouver Island in this quiet, untouched bay called Robson Bight. Now, it was at the mouth of a virgin Sitka River estuary. Uh, which at that time was the last unlogged, untouched river valley on eastern Vancouver Island. And it was uh, really full of killer whales. And over the next few summers, we got to know the whales as individuals, and we had uh, names for them. And uh, we saw that they came back to these favorite places, to, to Robson Bight and to the areas that they knew really well. Uh, uh, year after year, and they'd also feed at the um, uh, river mouth here and rest at the surface. They'd also rub on one of the beaches here. Um, this Most of this area had very sharp barnacle-encrusted rocks, but near Robson Bight, there was a place with smooth pebbles and sand, and the whales came here to rub and spend time playing. And this was something unique to these northern community killer whales, which was a kind of cultural activity uh, that's passed on. So the Robson Bight area, where we were lucky to be doing this uh, amazing research, uh, was, we realized, was a really important area for the northern community killer whales. We weren't calling it a critical habitat or a core area. Those terms didn't really uh, di didn't really exist in terms of the marine habitat at that time. Now, um, that same year, Mike Big was beginning his pioneer work on killer whale photo IDs, sorting out the individuals and the families or the pods. And his study had been financed by the Canadian government over concern that the aquarium captors in that region were taking too many whales. And the captors were saying that there are thousands out there every time they were going out. And we needed to know how many. And then three or four years after uh, Mike started, John Ford began his work recording each pod and finding the dialects and building on this photo ID work. And it came to a point where we began to realize that the families or the pods of the orcas that we were watching were being systematically cropped year after year for aquariums. And Mike Biggs' uh, detective work revealed that several US and Canadian aquariums and fishermen who had been targeting what turned out to be only two populations, um, totaling about 300 to 350 orcas, 
that these orcas have been caught 28 times over a seven year period and uh, removing a total of 67 individuals, um, mainly going to aquariums in North America and Europe, including at least 11 who died in the nets. Now at the same time this was happening, uh, the loggers, and this is why I was telling you about Robson Bight, the loggers were moving in and preparing to convert the rubbing beaches and resting area and the, and the prime Salmon River habitat for this northern community who are one of the populations being captured into a log dump and a sorting ground at Robson Bight. And so while people were really loving to see these large dolphins, uh, killer whales in captivity and celebrating them, they were unaware that the situation was actually completely dire, that the orcas were in danger of disappearing entirely from the Northwest and decisions about their management were being made entirely without science. So I, I wrote this article uh, at the time, uh, interviewing the logging company executive and a lot of the people involved uh, in killer whales. And um, the logging company executive was quite interesting. He, they, he said that taking the logs out of the valley upstream was completely out of the question, that it was far too expensive, and uh, anyway, those blackfish are always on the move, and there are plenty of places for them to go. And I told him about the rubbing behavior, but remember at that time, there, was, there were no, actually there were no published papers on, on killer whales at all. I mean, there was no one saying this rubbing behavior was important to protect or even saying how many killer whales there were in the wild. Uh, not that the uh, logging company executives are reading the, the uh, literature anyway. But uh, at the end of the interview, he gave me this great quote that the whales will probably just rub on the logs. And um, that led to a debate in British Columbia, which happened over several years, which you know, is similar in some ways to um, the kinds of debates that are going on now in different cities about um, captivity and what to do with dolphins and that sort of thing. And the questions were, did we want killer whales or did we want log booms? And a loose group of us made a public campaign and I learned about the the power of expert views and assessments, because even in the absence of published papers, the experts at that time, Mike Big and John Ford, uh, went back into their data to see what they could quantify, and they came up with a statement of how, about how often the whales were using the bite and how this was considered a critical habitat core area. And this was really the birth of that concept with uh, killer whales. And you can imagine um, orcas trying to get a breath of air in between the logs, uh, never mind trying to, rub, to rub on them. So, and the amazing result was that after a debate in the legislature in two or three years and a lot of public support and a lot more articles and TV and everything else, we, we actually won this uh, conservation um, campaign and the loggers were not allowed to boom their logs in Robson Bight, and it was made an ecological reserve, and we felt good about it, even though it was a very, very small area. I've put a magnifying glass there. You can hardly uh, see it, in fact. And the, it's, it's about 17 square kilometers for the land area and a little bit more for the water area, although the water area is not really officially protected, although it's a de facto reserve. So we didn't, we were really just learning and didn't ask for anywhere near enough. So I'll come back to the habitat issues, which is a lot of what I'm working on these days in a few minutes, but I wanted to give a brief timeline of research in the wild and in captivity uh, leading up to where we are now. And this is really just hitting a few selective um, points. So. I always like to go back to Aristotle uh, to see what he has to say. I mean, he was the first marine biologist, and usually um, 
there are interesting things that are that are buried in that text. And uh, in terms of photo ID, I thought it was very interesting that he had, there's this passage where he talks about the fishermen nicking the tails of the dolphins to tell them apart. You know whether it it um, was actually the um, I mean, as we know, you don't need to nick the tails. You can tell them from the dorsal fins. But he had that idea of individual identification. And really, that's the first place you can see it. Now, um, re really, there was not much done for about 2,000 years after that in terms of studies in the wild. Uh, and I think one of the interesting highlights then is Carl Hubbs, who was a fish biologist in Michigan, who moved out to the west, southwest uh, California, San Diego, started teaching at Scripps and the University of California, and noticed there were these rather big uh, animals moving alongside the coastline, and looked at the literature and saw that, well, gray whales, there were some accounts of them even having gone extinct already, or that they were probably extinct. And he started getting his students involved in watching them and climbing up on the buildings of the University of California, including uh, um, Ken Norris was a student at that time, was one of the people who went, went uh, gray whale watching. And I'll talk about him in a, few, in a couple minutes. And uh, that really started the, the whale watching as well as a lot of the research um, that, that we um, that we've seen since then. Now, be between 1970 and 75, there was really a revolution in whale and dolphin research with photo ID studies. And I remember this conference in um, uh, November 1975 in Indiana, which was one of the, the first whale conferences when people were talking about wild whale research. And there were about 50 or 60 of the uh, the experts at that time in the room. And, uh, you know, th this was a time, this is, you know, long before the internet or even when phone calls were incredibly expensive and it took months to publish papers. And really what we had there was um, three or four uh, studies that were beginning in different parts of the world. Roger Payne doing southern right whale research and Mike Big with uh, killer whale research, and um, uh, gray whales with uh, Jim Darling, and humpback whales with Steve Katona, who are all still senior figures in um, the field of, of whale and dolphin research, uh, and Bernd Wersig with bottlenose dolphins. And they were all in the room together, and the conversations were just amazing, you know, showing these photographs that no one had ever seen before and that you could actually identify all these individual populations. And, and that was really the opening door of, you know, this was stuff that may have happened on the plains of Africa decades below, but it was, this was decades before, but this was the first time it happened with, um, out in the sea with uh, whales and dolphins. Um, and because of all the things, I mean, this was the opening door to being able to tell individuals uh, where they go, do they come back, who do they socialize with, uh, where do they migrate to. Um, it, it's a baseline for the numbers, the abundance. It's a, a lot of things. And then you have start to have acoustics and genetics on top of that, which have come in in more recent years, which build on the photo ID work. Um, so looking at, at on the captive side now, 1938 was the first, um, at least I think was the first aquarium in the U.S. that was um, exhibiting bottlenose dolphins in Florida uh, at Marineland with the Caldwells were doing some early research there. And you have Winthrop Kellogg and the Navy um, reporting on the Navy sonar studies in the U.S with a lot of applications for marine navigation. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about all the, the physiology and the other studies because we have people that are going to be talking about that. I'm mainly focusing on what relates to um, research and conservation in the wild. 
Uh, but w there was a huge interest um, in whales and dolphins that was drawn, that the people were drawn to through this book, Mind of the Dolphin, by John Lilly. It was, very, it was a controversial character at the time. And, um, but, but um, his books were bestsellers, and you know, it, he did a lot of work in captivity, had experiments with people living with dolphins individually in captivity, and, and other things. Um, and then Ken Norris um, really was a very interesting, because he, he started with, uh, with the gray whale watching out in the wild, then he became manager of marine land of the Pacific, a curator uh, in the early days when they were exhibiting bottlenose dolphins and killer whales, and and then went from there to becoming a, a naturalist in the wild and uh, working with um, whales and dolphins and becoming a kind of mentor to a whole generation of um, scientists who are working today. Uh, and to some extent, Karen Pryor as well. She was working out in Hawaii but also really aware of, of these populations of the animals out in the wild and connecting people to them. So about um, 25 years ago, I also came to Bar Barcelona for the first time to see Ulysses, the killer whale, and he was all alone except for a dolphin at that time, and he'd been uh, in Barcelona for about 12 years and was outgrowing his pool. And I came here for WDC, w, then WDCS, um, and really talking, really saying that here was a perfect candidate to experiment with this idea of returning them to the wild. Um, at that time, um, Keiko, this was before Keiko Free Willy happened, and, and actually that was a, a case of a, a male who had been a male orca who had been in captivity for much, much longer than um, Ulysses, um, I think 20 years rather than 10 years. Um, but anyway, we, we uh, talked about this and um, you know the discussion was, it was said that Ulysses would only be on breeding loan to SeaWorld. The decision be, you know, came that that was the only place that he could go and that um, he would return to Barcelona when there was a bigger pool, and then they would reconsider returning him to the wild. That was actually in, in the quotes at the time. And at the end of this uh, story in the LA Times um, in 1992, we said if he's sold or given to the Americans, he's gone forever. And Ulysses did indeed leave Barcelona and he's still, he's actually still in San Diego. He's now the oldest male in captivity and the fifth oldest killer whale overall. And I also went to uh, Reino Aventura uh, in Mexico where, where Keiko was. Um, it was in the process, I was visiting all these aquariums partly as a project for WDC to do a report that would look at the educational and scientific value and other um, um, issues surrounding uh, capture and captivity, um, just to see how much you know how much value there was in the in the view of um, you know what could you measure, what could you quantify, and really um, I found that um, even in the the best cases the amount of the budget being spent for education and research was really tiny. And, and partly that was a factor of it cost so much to keep these animals in captivity. The facilities, you know, not just building the facilities, but maintaining them and having the staff and all the professional people that there's not really a lot left over. So beyond exposing the public to the um, the, the whales and the dolphins, uh, the, the programs, the educational programs and the scientific work um, was a really very tiny part of the budget. So 
I think I think one, one thing that captivity did do, and what research in the in the wild did early on, was it set the stage for the the Save the Whale movement in the late 60s and early 70s. There were other factors, like Sam Labuddy did this amazing video of of uh, dolphins being killed in tuna fishing. There were um, a total of six million dolphins killed uh, through. Um, uh, tuna fishing over a, you know several decades is really a staggering number, uh, and this um, was not really being addressed. And, and this video just mobilized uh, an enormous number of people. And eventually, the Marine Mammal Protection Act in the U.S. came in, and a number of other laws, um, and the the pressure of the public to have dolphin-friendly tuna and all that really has um, taken the number down to about 5,000 year a year uh, deaths, which is still far too many, but is a fraction of what it used to be. Um, also, the Greenpeace uh, famous photograph, which I reproduced down here, of, um, of putting themselves between the harpoon and the sperm whale being killed by the Russian um, whalers in the early 70s. That was a really important photograph in terms of mobilizing people. So I, I think what we saw then um, after this sort of initial um, conservation value from captivity and from the wild was captivity was becoming increasingly commercial, uh, largely motivated through, through the work that SeaWorld did and the, you know, the becoming a really big business. And um, at the same time, we were realizing through in the wild research that captured animals were leaving gaps in wild populations and that there were abuses during the captures. And of course, in captivity, um, we were learning that captive orcas in particular, but also dolphins were suffering sensory deprivation, leading to serious problems. And, and then there was this, um, really implosion of uh, captive whale and dolphin business uh, in the last 10 years with um, th three trainers being killed plus a visitor. Actually, some of that happened earlier than that, but it wasn't widely known until movies like Blackfish came out and books like Death at SeaWorld, which really um, uh, you know, made this much more of a public uh, business and led to a backlash against SeaWorld with declining visitor numbers and uh, local and national laws um, against capturing and keeping cetaceans. Now, just as a, as a quick sidebar, we do have this huge industry now developing in Asia, which is sort of independent of our efforts in Europe and North America and is uh, concerning a lot of us. Um, China is building uh, many new large uh, cetacean facilities. And um, there are about 20 killer whales that have been captured for uh, aquariums largely in China, three of them in Moscow. Um, but that's, you know, that's a whole, uh, you know, a whole other issue. And I think what, partly what we do here and what we're doing in the West uh, I, you know, we're hoping we'll have some influence uh, that will go wider as well. So what, what have we learned from wild and captive research and, and conservation? Well, I already said this about the cost um, being, um, leaving not much of a budget for research and education. Um, I think we need to focus not just on saving the whales, that's something that we've learned through the conservation movement, but we have, to, um, we have to understand and to save their habitat. They have to have places to live in the sea and ecosystems that support them. And of course, you can't do habitat studies in, in captivity. So in, in leading into this next section um, that I'm going to talk about habitat, you know, whales and dolphins have specific vulnerability. You have 25 percent of the, one, the 130 marine mammal species that are threatened 
Um, it's about 25% of the 90 cetacean species as well that have a, an IUCN threatened category attached to them. On the other hand, they are visible indicators of biodiversity and ocean health. Um, as, as was pointed out in, um, in Barcelona waters as well. You know, anywhere you see them, you, you have an idea that, there's, um, that there is some measure of health there unless they're traveling through quickly. And they're also flagship species that, that give us really powerful political and public levers for research and conservation of less popular organisms. So the overall status of marine protected areas, MPAs, marine protected areas, um, there are 20,000 of them worldwide. Uh, there, are, as of 2017, only a little more than 5% of the ocean is in MPAs, and we have an Aichi target 11, um, which um, stipulates that 10%, the countries of the world have agreed to this, that 10% of the ocean uh, is going to be protected by 2020, so we're still a long way uh, from that and only three years away from it. And in fact, IUCN um, a couple years ago revised the ideal target. 10% was a minimal target. 30% is the real target for protection in MPAs by 2030. Now only today, less than 1%, 0.7% is highly protected, by which I mean no fishing, uh, no industrial development at all. And you know, it's generally agreed we need more of these areas um, for critical habitat of different species and that sort of thing. And really the target is at least 3% of the ocean. And most worrisome of all is how little is on the high seas, which is most of the ocean. Uh, so we have only 0.25%, less than a quarter of a percent on the high seas, uh, the international waters that has any kind of protection. And there are whale and dolphin habitats represented in this, but um, just a few, and I'll, I'll, I'll go over some of those. The top 10 largest MPAs represent more than 50% of the global MPA coverage. So these are areas like the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and Papahanaumokuakea, which is the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And, and these have fantastic uh, marine mammal populations, but um, the, the um, areas were really set up with um, uh, for political reasons. So it might have started with a goal for m some marine mammal or biodiversity um, protection, but really you still have, it still goes back to the politicians that are draw drawing lines on the map and looking at where their fishing is and other things that they want to safely e exclude. Um, so, yeah, this poster that we did uh, in 2012 shows the 575 MPAs with whale and dolphin habitat. And um, these, you can see, I mean, most of them are just dots on the map. There are a few gray areas, mainly in the Pacific, um, that are the larger areas. Um, and again, these are, these are political designations. And I think it's really I instructive to look where they are. They're really just along the coastlines and around islands. Uh, so they're not on the high seas. And in fact, if you look at most of these areas, many of them are just the uh, favorite study areas of researchers and their professors. Um, you know, that's sort of human nature, of, you know, where these things get protected. But they're little dots on the map, and we really need to go a lot further than that. So who's responsible for protecting um, the high seas? Um, we have a, a couple of, of uh, groups. Sorry for all the acronyms. I put a little bit down below, but OSPR in the Northeast Atlantic is doing a lot in terms of identifying areas. Most of these initiatives on the right-hand side are identification of important areas, not actual protection 
on the high seas. But uh, Camelar in the Southern Ocean is in charge of protecting Antarctic waters. Um, and, and they've actually recently did set aside uh, the Ross Sea, uh, or part of it at least. And uh, CMS, the Convention on Migratory Species, has seven regional marine mammal treaties and has done a lot of work in the Mediterranean here with ACABAMS in terms of identifying important habitats. Now the U United Nations um, areas beyond national jurisdiction, the ABNJ process is working on a mechanism to manage high seas development and enforce the protection measures. And this is really the, the thing that we need, the, this kind of work. And it's, it's only been in the last year that countries have agreed that they will um, discuss this and try and work out the process. And that's now um, um, in, in process. I mean, it, it could take one or two years, or it could be like the law of the sea and take another 10 years. We hope not. So I'm going to talk mainly about CMS because, uh, sorry, about CBD, Convention on Biological Diversity, because they've had this series of workshops around the ocean, um, around, in different parts of the ocean, to identify ecologically or biologically significant areas, EBSs, and the, as, you know, whether they're for, for important diversity. And really, we did an a, um, examination of all the EBSs that had been created, several hundred of them, and found that um, uh, marine mammals, and, and particularly whales and dolphins, were not being included very much. So really, really only um, uh, humpback whales uh, were included to any extent. Um, and they're, you know, very easy pickings in terms of uh, identifying where their um, breeding habitat is in Hawaii and Caribbean and that sort of thing. Um, so only 15% of all these EBSs had any, any um, marine mammal, um, uh, marine mammals listed as a primary feature. And they were often, uh, marine mammals were often being used just in a general way you know, there's biodiversity here, and, and uh, you know, this species of whale is, is there, you know, so let's include that, which is not a very, um, it's not uh, a very scientific, data-driven, data-driven way of doing this work. And there was really no standardized method for presenting this evidence or uh, agreeing to it from workshop to workshop. So we set up um, initially a committee on marine mammal protected areas and started holding conferences beginning in 2009 in Hawaii to bring the marine protected area people together with the whale and dolphin and other marine mammal people. And out of that, in 2013, we realized we needed um, something with teeth to try to uh, influence the process of getting protected areas and habitat for um, whales and dolphins on the open ocean. So we set up this task force under the IUCN um, within the Species Survival Commission and the World Commission on Protected Areas. And we spent a couple of years um, going around um, uh, talking to different uh, UN bodies and IUCN and governments and getting support for the idea. And we talked to the bird people too, because as usual, the bird people are far ahead of the marine mammal people in any work that like this that's going on. And in fact, they were really driving the EBSA process in the ocean uh, in terms of, um, they had the data, they had supported by, you know, 30 uh, plus years of work and uh, a thousand plus bird scientists and millions of bird watchers and many NGOs in every country. And, and they're, you know, they created these things called IBAs, important bird areas, which are now called important bird and biodiversity areas. Um, and in Europe, for example, the SACs, the Special Areas of Conservation, really an enormous number of them 
came from IBAs. They started as IBAs and they were just able to say, okay, that's, that's a candidate SAC because the brood people had done their homework and the, the whale and dolphin people were a couple of decades behind. So we realized that um, we needed a strategy to get marine mammals into this um, conservation planning. So we developed this tool called IMAs, Important Marine Mammal Areas, and uh, um, brought together a lot of experts. Um, this is the definition of it, a discrete area of habitat important for one or more marine mammal species that has the potential to be delineated and managed for conservation. So basic definition and, um, you know, it's important to realize an IMA is not an MPA and an MPAs are not IMAs. So these are non-political uh, tools uh, to inform the development and management practice of place-based conservation. And, and the rationale for develop, developing them is, again, to have a consistent expert process um, that's independent of socioeconomic as well as political concerns, um, to give input into the habitats for all the marine mammals and their biodiversity, and, um, and, for, and contributing to these uh, national and international conservation tools uh, and habitat protection measures, including the EPSAs. Also, KBAs is something that IUCN has developed, K key biodiversity areas, which is now coming on stream. Um, it, it's a more uh, threshold-driven tool than what we have, but it's, um, it's going to be very important. And um, also, national and regional measures are important. Marine spatial planning, more than 100 countries of the world have signed up to marine spatial planning, including Europe, across Europe, uh, which means that decisions are going to be made in the national waters of all these countries about what they're going to, um, how they're going to zone their waters. And if we don't have any marine mammal data, they won't be considered at all. So it's really important to have this tool uh, to be able to come to the table. Um, so we, we spent more than a year working on the criteria. I won't go into that in detail. There's a lot of information on this website, marinemammalhabitat.org, um, which is, gives the background of all this. But the one thing to say about this is that we really tried to align the criteria very carefully to the existing CBD EBSA criteria, to the KBA criteria, to, to existing criteria that's being used to define um, important habitats so that, you know, we're not reinventing anything, but we're making sure, we wanted to make sure that marine mammals were accounted for. So this process that we've developed for identification, anyone can submit an area of interest and from that area of interest, we have a series of workshops, um, and at a workshop, the areas of interest then are, are considered to become candidate uh, IMAs, um, which come out of this expert workshop, and then they go to an independent panel, peer-reviewed panel, um, and sometimes we'll go back to the workshop or back to individual people before finally being approved. And this, is, this was sort of our starting point for the first workshop, which was last year. Um, and this just gives you an idea of what marine mammal habitat we have under consideration as it stands, um, or, or as it stood last year. Uh, the red areas are existing marine protected areas with marine mammal habitat, with important marine mammal habitat. The blue areas are proposed. Uh, the tan areas are um, CBD, EBSA areas with marine mammals. Uh, and then there are a lot of smaller areas that you can't quite see that are um, uh, like international maritime organization um, ship areas that are trying to avoid hitting cetaceans and that sort of thing. And this is actually just a slightly more 
uh, recent version of that same map. Um, so our, this is what we started with in the Mediterranean a year ago. And um, again, with the red being existing areas and blue proposed and um, tan areas, uh, EBSAs. And through a, an expert workshop in uh, Hania, Greece, um, with about 25 or 30 experts from around the Mediterranean, this was the resulting, actually this is the map that's been through the um, expert process. So you can view this in detail with descriptions of all these areas. You can see there is one along the coast here. Manel was part of this process and um, contributed um, valuable data that be, uh, became an IMA there. And about 80% of the IMAs that were proposed were um, accepted in this case. And then um, in the spring, we're trying to do at least one of these workshops a year. We have funding for about five or six years. Um, this was in the Pacific Islands, and you can just see the, the candidate IMAs because they have not finished the expert process. There are about 28 of them, and the blue areas are the areas of interest. Uh, we should have those available end of October. And so our first area was the Mediterranean, the Pacific Islands, and then um, next March we're going to the Northeast Indian Ocean. And we have um, started arrangements for the, the, the workshops after that in 2019, 2020, and 2021. And um, it looks like we also have some funding for an Antarctic workshop as well, but there are there's still gaps, you know. So it's 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 a big work to uh, um, to cover the whole ocean. Um, following up from IMAs, uh, we we have a, a component of this project that is trying to implement three of the IMA IMAs that are created as case studies. So so the IMA process itself is pure science. The implementation is, you know, can you make it a marine protected area, or does this make sense, being, you know, being a um, uh, an area that's um, uh, under um, subject to ship strike, and you want to create, you know, work with the IMO to uh, for that, or you know, any no, any number of things, but it's it's the whole implementation. So the first one we're doing there will be in Palau in October, and we're. They're uh, just a small group of us going there to work on dugong and spinner dolphin in, uh, in the inshore waters. So we want to just try to introduce IMAs into marine mammal habitat considerations really at, at all levels um, that are possible. And, and we all already see from the Mediterranean some uh, interest in the areas that were really just announced in the, in the last month or so. Uh, uh, you know, really just finalized this summer. Uh, and there is traction already in some of these areas in terms of getting governments to look at them and say, okay, this is an international body of scientists that uh, with u using a tool that's recognized by all these agencies, uh, okay, we better pay attention to it. Um, so, you know, we, we have some hope, we'll see. So the big question um, is how we get from from here and here and here, you know, being um, from the, taking the public from the pool and from the narrow areas along the sea, um, uh, sorry, along the uh, the coastlines, out into the open ocean, and to get them to care about them enough to protect what's going on. So I think coming back to this map, this is our huge challenge and our opportunity over the next few years. You know, while, while the fishing industry, oil and gas, and others are working really hard to develop the um, ocean for industrial potential, we also need to harness the public passion for whales and dolphins and to use the goodwill uh, that we're building up by recognizing that dolphins don't belong in captivity and doing something about it as we are here. 
and maybe this will help lead to more attention toward, to, toward uh, protecting their uh, homes on the um, high seas in pelagic waters as well, where these sort of new battlegrounds of conservation are emerging. And I think the key will be implementing and creating uh, MPAs, uh, effective MPAs, which is actually a whole other subject. So I've heard the idea that um, Barcelona wants to keep the links to these individual dolphins and to follow their lives wherever they go, which I think is great. And I think also that aquariums uh, can build links to research in the wild through remote monitoring, um, hydrophones, um, you know, all these other ways to link work that's going on um, offshore from uh, Barcelona, you know, and to bring it right to the people where they are. And I, th you know, this is something that's starting to happen. I see it with seabirds and I see it in, in some different land-based centers in different parts of the world. And I think that's a really exciting role for um, uh, zoos and aquariums. And I think maybe one day people on land can be actually the monitors for what is going on in the open ocean as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for your talk. Uh, thank you for this great scope vision. Uh, it's interesting to, to know that even if most of the species of cetaceans are already protected, if we don't do anything for the habitat, or the habitat is not protected, then it's, it's worth it. it, it it's worth it to, to protect the species. Uh, it was a pleasure to see this, this image, this, 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 uh, this zoom out of the problem. We are here talking at the end of six individuals. Uh, but I think that we have also to, to, to focus on, on, on this, these ones. Uh, we have time for some questions. Are there any questions? We've got one. Hello, good morning. I'm Marta Guma. I'm the president of EPANA. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. And I'm very grateful to the Barcelona Town Council for this fantastic initiative to set this workshop. I have a very specific um, question regarding CITES. CITES has been authorizing imports and captures um, according to a, a supposed scientific research, those of us who work in conservation and are concerned about uh, the animal welfare, we know very well, as you have illustrated, that the part of the budget that it's spent in aquaria in scientific research is very little. And I guess that they do that just as a, an excuse, as a justification to say that they do educational activities and scientific research research of um, cetacean behavior in captivity. But in practice, that's not the case. So here we have a very serious problem. We had an issue in Laurel Parque with the killer whale there. It was very controversial because as long as CITES keeps authorizing imports because they believe that according to scientific criteria, they have to give their authorization, well, we will never get anywhere. All of us countries that are um, part of the CITES, in the case of Europe, for example, so I would like to know your experience in, at the U IUCN, uh, your connection with CITES, if you have dealt with the topic, if there is a will to reach an agreement, if CITES someday will be able to say, uh, or will be daring enough, bold enough to say, look, we, we can't authorize this import because these animals will be exploited. They will not be subject to scientific research. So I'm very interested in this um, CITES situation because as, as long as they authorize these imports and exchanges, uh, we will never put an end to captivity. Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah, that's a big difficult question. I, I don't work with CITES. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, there are other 
people in the group that I, you know, groups that I work with who are experts in that. However, you know, yes, we come up against it. You know, I, I work in Russia, for example, and we have killer whale. Um, we, we look at the CITES permits for killer whales being exported from Russia to China and and see that they can get get them, although they don't always get them, which uh -huh. is another issue. But it's, um, uh, you know, I think one of, one of the issues has to do whether they're endangered or not. Um, and there may be somebody else who can come in on this, but if they, if they had carry an endangered status, um, you know, that's, that's a red flag. And that, and that endangered status comes from the IUCN, indeed. Um, and I, but IUCN is a, you know, big sprawling organization. So um, that's the red list, which is decided by different um, uh, groups within the Species Survival Commission. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, killer whales and bottlenose dolphins are not considered endangered. However, there are populations of them that are. Uh, for example, the you know the west coast of the U.S. has well it carries an endangered rating from the U.S., which is quite strong. That southern community that was captured so much. So I mean, there'd be no way that they would be able to you know to capture them. I mean, they'd have the entire you know state of Washington and beyond you know uh, stopping it. But it's. Um, uh, and the, and there there I think there are some there are bottlenose dolphin populations in the Mediterranean are endangered aren't they? Yeah, so Black Sea, yeah. So it, it's yeah I mean there are ways around it. That's that's you know that's what happens and and what you call research and what you call education. You know that's really tough. You know, and and is it is it not research or any education, because your budget is uh, ten million and you only spend a thousand um, euros a year? You know, I don't. You know, it's not it's not really fair, of course. But uh, and but you know, I, I, I'm not sure what you can do. I, you know, I think I think it's gonna it it'll come down to um, individual governments and individual places, you know, deciding that, you know, things have moved on as Barcelona is seeing in Mexico City recently and um, more and more places. Um, and, you know, that, that's the way it ends. Yeah. Did it, it, do you have anything else to say about CITES? No. But no, nonetheless, uh, Eric, we will have a, a, a session this after lunch with some aspects of legal activities and okay. the last aspects, and I think that we can move this uh, these questions to the, okay. to the to this after lunch and then focus on, on the presentation. Okay. There is another uh, question around here. No, here. Uh, hi, um, I work with uh, Manel and mm -hmm. Alba and Carla and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So my question is more directed to what you mentioned about increasing the awareness of people, of the public, mm -hmm. citizens for the marine mammal mm -hmm. protected areas. Mm -hmm. um, and as Manel said. Now in Submon, we're very, very interested in increasing mm -hmm. perception of the citizens on mm -hmm. how the ocean affects them, how everything's important. So what is your opinion about uh, doing this through tourism? So taking them whale watching, mm -hmm. uh, getting them closer to the sea. Mm -hmm. Would you agree to do that maybe even in the marine mammal protected areas to increase mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. uh, not just the awareness, but also bring some more money and maybe pay, mm -hmm. <coughs> sorry, pay for those uh, protected mm -hmm. areas and, mm -hmm. and make them survive long term. Or mm -hmm. do you think the drawbacks are would be worse? And you're not. Well, it you know it's um, it's a question that has to be answered differently depending on the place in the world. In general, yes, I think it's a good idea and it can provide valuable uh, tourism income, and it has. You know, we look at places like Iceland where it's really revitalized a lot of northern communities. And, you know, Iceland has a nice geography in the sense that um, uh, boats can go, go out from all different sides of the country. When you have places um, like um, uh, the northwest U.S. Uh, San Juan Islands and, you know, southern Vancouver Island, 
you have the, the, the opposite kind of situation where you have a lot of boats coming from two different countries and you know five or six different cities all converging on one small area. And you, and you have a huge problem there. And it, it should go back to a lot more land-based uh, whale watching there, which is also very possible. I mean, I think land-based, you know, when you can do land-based or remote work with, um, uh, with any uh, marine animal, you know, uh, there's a lot of rem remote watching done with seabirds, for example, uh, in Scotland. Uh, which which is tremendous, you know, and it's re really high high definition uh, cameras looking. It's not quite so possible with with dolphins, but but I think yes, you can. You, tourism is one of the answers, and it helps support marine protected areas. But you need to do zoning, you know, that recognize that there's certain critical habitats that shouldn't be disturbed. There are other areas where, you know, you can have mixed boats and. Um, and the animals, and people can see them and appreciate them. But, you know, Barcelona also can have, the, we could have hydrophones out there, we could have a lot of stuff going on out there with the research that's uh, coming in to the city and really uh, creating a, a huge impact and, and in good timing for the uh, marine mammal biennial, you know, coming up and another task for you to do over the next two years. No, I think it could be it could be really exciting to do because you know we re people don't realize you know what's right out there on their doorstep. Okay, thank you. Hey, good morning. Thank you for staying here, Ari. I support you everything you say. The, the first thing uh, I want to say. Uh, I don't, I don't like to and any animal in captivity, any, any, just not mammifers, it's any. Okay. Yeah, uh, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, the question is about, you, we talk about the movie about fish. Yeah, I remember we you talking, I remember also that you, the cough, and not the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question is, uh, I don't like any animal in captivity, mm -hmm. especially dolphin or orcas. But the problem is in wild is that many countries don't respect the international convention and kill any many dolphins, sharks, uh, whales. So where is the solution for you? Because if you, we don't like any animals in captivity and, and then we don't respect in, in the wild, where is the solution? You understand what I mean? Yes, but I, I think. Thank you very much. I I think we can educate, um, you know, without captivity. I think actually uh, captivity is giving you the is giving the wrong message, really, in terms of of um, you know what people see by us bringing animals into captivity. So to to do it in the wild, yes, you're, you're right. There are huge challenges to doing that. And, and 30 or 40 years ago, we would have said it was impossible to do. But now we do have this huge whale watching industry. There are 15 million people a year now going whale watching in more than 100 countries. So it's, it has grown tremendously. And, uh, and actually, it's several million of that, about 2 million, are from land, you know, in places like South Africa. Argentina, uh, U.S., West Coast, and uh, you know, re really interacting, um, being able to see the, the animals watch natural behavior without disturbing them. So I, th I think there are a lot of lessons that are starting to be gained from uh, from wild behavior, and and the challenge now is to bring that even more and to go further out into the high seas and see what's out there because we have, I mean, we have not, not just um, more than 50% of the surface area, but we have 99% of the habitats on the planet are in the, in the deep ocean. And, and we just, we're, you know, we're completely missing that. So I think with, with technology, I mean, I think that our technology is really, this is where it comes in and can be really valuable uh, in terms of bringing that, those messages back. 
Do you think you will have time for one more question? Ah, well then, have to be. Well, no. Hola. Hola, Eric. Hello, Eric. My question. Hello, here. I'm connected to the oceanog oceanography and meteorology, and in this new, with this new concept of protected areas, with the changes that we see um, in the oceans, it's a very dynamic thing because it has a connection with the atmosphere, and we forecast many changes, and this is due to global warming, acidification. So how do you integrate this in your new concept and in the future of these new protected areas? Well, it's, um, you know, part of the um, challenge with, with all this is that we do have the background of, you know, huge changes going on on our planet as well as the ocean. Um, the IMAs, the, you know, the important marine mammal area concept does have um, uh, some, you know, we've had some thinking about climate change and how these could be monitors for um, for climate change, you know, by getting baseline data and then see, you know, revisiting them periodically. So, but that's sort of scientific monitoring. In terms of actual marine protected areas, um, allowing for it, uh, people are talking about, uh, marine protected area managers are talking about things like um, creating zones, um, so that, um, you know, there's more latitude for movement. I mean, already we, we have um, marine mammals are highly mobile anyway, so, you know, that you have larger areas generally than you have on land. So the, the challenges are different than, than with climate change on land, and acidification, of course, is, is different. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think we're all facing these things, and they're, you know, they're being written into the management plans of marine protected areas. But, you know, it's difficult for us to see uh, five years in advance, much less, you know, 10 or 20 years in advance, which is what we're talking about. So we're all, we're all in the same boat together, really. Yeah. Okay, then uh, we have two more questions, one in the second line and one in the third line, and then after that we will have a coffee break and we'll have time to, to talk. Then, Isabella, please. Hi, Isabella, yes. University of Paris. I'll be quick, yeah. um, I promise. I was just wondering, I read a few papers recently that say, uh, discussing animal welfare specifically in terms of wild dolphins and wild marine mammals and conservation can be really useful and it sort of brings it away from the population discussion to more individuals. I was just wondering in your your new group with the IMAs and your workshops, does the work welfare come up yet at all or is it something you're thinking about? Or? It doesn't come up with IMAs really. Uh, I mean, let me think. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's in the background but it's not, um, it's not, you, it's not like a criteria but the, there is there is a criterion that talks about um, uh, individual. Um, well, it's more it's more in the sense of culture that you have different small groups that might behave differently, and you can. Um, that's something that we perceive as being valuable, but it's not a welfare. No, I don't I don't think so. Um, I mean, it would come up with. Um, uh, I suppose in some marine protected area concept, contexts it would come up, but not really in IMAs. Yeah. Okay, then the last one, please. Yeah. Hola, buen día. So, uh, Good morning. I'm Dorsi Kari from the Zoo, Zoo 21 Citizen Initiative. We basically have gathered um, and collected signatures so that we can um, transform the Barcelona Zoo. It's been a pleasure to listen to you with this history of um, conservation. It's a luxury to have you here and to get to know the evolution of um, your work and uh, this work that uh, you have been doing. One of the things that we propose is precisely 
having to do with the budgets uh, that are devoted to animals in captivity and they don't have enough budget for education and research as they should do. So we propose that they should spend this money in conservation of the habitat. So um, we have a network of 300 zoos, so if they spent this money in the actual conservation of habitats and with the technologies that we have today in Aquaria, well, we've got fantastic technology to show how conservation of habitats is done through uh, immersive virtual technology. Sorry, could you go to the point, to your question? So I think that the scientific community there is no consensus, I believe, in the scientific um, community regarding the scientific criteria as to how, how conservation is to be done. Is it better done in captivity or spending resources? And there are studies that propose uh, uh, dolphin studies that say that dolphins in captivity are OK, that populations are maintained. And this is a contradiction to me. So, to your mind, as a scientist, which is the perspective of the scientific community regarding these positions as to which are the best conservation models for endangered species? Well, I mean, it depends on the species, but I would say, you know, obviously my focus is in the wild and what, what's happening, um, you know, supporting that work, because, that, I mean, that, in the end, that's, that's all you have. You know, we, we um, you know, and it's so important for our own survival as well as to have a healthy, healthy ocean and healthy um, land areas for animals. Uh, it's, um, uh, I mean, the, the, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the way you were describing it was, was really nice. I, you know, if you could, um, you know, use that kind of money to support work that's going on in the wild, through through marine protected areas, and then uh, gain a connection to those areas, and use that information both about uh, the support that you're giving and the um, uh, what's going on in those habitats with those animals. I, you know, to me, that's by far the best the best use of that. So, not sure I answered your question, but. I tried. Thank you very much. Very difficult questions. Okay. Thank you very much for your answers. Uh, thank you for your talk. Thank you, Eric. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here and um, Lerica, ahora ni al We'll break for coffee now and we'll be back at 12.15. There's someone outside that will guide you to the coffee break area, which is upstairs. Eric has brought these books with him and well, he has offered very generous discounts on the price, but we don't have many copies. <laughs> I don't think he flew with Welling, but we know that, you know, hand baggage is limited. So basically, he has these leaflets, these discount vouchers for the attendees of the workshop. So you can enjoy between 30 and 35% of these counts, plus a poster, a gift. So if you're interested, if you want Eric to send you this book, and you will enjoy that, the discount plus the poster. See you back at 12.15.
those dolphins. And there's also something I wanted uh, to say that we're going to be talking about causes of death of bottlenose dolphins in the Catalan coastline. You know that Barcelona is a very diverse city. This session then is going to be very diverse. We're going to be having a presentation that will be given live, so to speak. Then we have a Skype presentation and one third mm, presentation, but the person who had to come apologize and we'll only have the PowerPoint of that presentation. So, well, we do ask for your understanding understanding uh, in order to have these different presentations taking place. First of all, we're going to be listening uh, to Dr. Aviad uh, Shenin, Shenin from the Haifa University in Israel, and he's the leader of the research group on uh, marine mammals. He's been working on a resident uh, population for some time at their coast, and then the idea is for him to explain both uh, how can we come close to a local resident population of bottlenose dolphins. So you have 20 minutes. And at five and one, I'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Manel, for inviting me. It's a great uh, honor to be here in Barcelona. And I will tell you a little bit of what we went through in the last, I would say, 20 years to do with uh, bottlenose dolphins. And uh, obviously, when you think about Israel, bottlenose dolphin is not the first thing that pop into your mind, I would guess. Maybe some other animals, uh, but, but not bottlenose dolphin. And it was the same also in the, for the Israeli mind. And um, to stress this uh, um, black hole of knowledge, we had uh, uh, last year, a conference that uh, analyzed the gap analysis where we don't have much data and it was done uh, in the Mediterranean. We met in Nice and uh, also um, Manel was there and we were there and there were a lot of uh, groups speaking about the gap of knowledge. And uh, the aim of it was to, to see where there is lack of knowledge and to put some more knowledge or emphasis into that area. And as you can see from the two graphs, the top one is boat effort, the bottom one is aerial effort. As, as you can see, there is very little effort in the eastern Mediterranean, the south of Mediterranean, no aerial effort in the eastern Mediterranean, and so on. So there is not much knowledge there. Even if you look at the entire effort and you divide it into the different areas, this is our Levantine area, and as you can see, there is very, very little effort there. So this is our starting point with this. And uh, a few crazy people, small NGO, started to, decided to do a change and start on the, start to work and research on some dolphins. The beginning were mainly looking at stranding data and uh, look at the stranded animals, and you'll have talks about here about all the knowledge that you can get from stranded animals. I'm not gonna speak about this part. Um, we were happy to get the academic umbrella of the University of Haifa and start the research under this umbrella. And then we started collected also sporadic sightings from fishermen, from yachtsmen, from different people that go around in the sea. And this was very valuable to start the work. And then we've started with the coastal, coastal work, going out there to the animals and see what we have there. Because at the beginning there was myth and stories, but there was no data at the time. So this is our search area. Um, we are the, the eastern part, the southern eastern part of the Mediterranean, as you can see. Um, we have a very nice connection to Barcelona through the sea, which I'll comment about soon, I will tell you. Um, but it's a small area. The entire coast is about 200 kilometers, that's it. And as all or most coastal res research, we've started working with a small inflatable boat, which we got a donation for, and we got some money for fuel. But it was m some money. And uh, unfortunately, um, it was too costly for an 
for an NGO, poor NGO that doesn't have much funding and doesn't have much bottlenose dolphin in the knowledge of the public and the governmental institute and so on. So we had to think out of the box and see how we can get to the animals, although we don't have money to get there. And uh, the idea was creating a win-win collaborations. And uh, I think this is a key factor for, having, for getting this first knowledge about those animals. So what we've done is we've contacted sailing, uh, yacht sailing schools, which go out there with their boats and uh, took their people out as part of some, uh, some um, fun stuff to do, apart from sailing. So we took them to see bottlenose dolphin. We got the uh, nature authorities uh, to, be, to be engaged, and we'll be able to go out with, with their boats, with their small uh, ripcraft inflatables. And then uh, we followed up by Maritime High School, which has their boat, and we took the high school children out there, look at the animals and study from them. And then the fishery department joined, and when they are doing inspection, they're collecting data for us. And the public, the private yacht owners that want to go also and see dolphins, that they have us on board and we collect data. So all these platforms, they don't cost us anything, which was very valuable for us. All the research stuff was done mainly by volunteers. So this is the basic. This is all how it started and how it's running today. So far, we've done um, seven, 770 surveys. We have a lot of mileage so far. So by now we have a, quite a robust information. It's mainly coastal information, but it's quite a robust and we can say something which is nice. 20 years ago, we weren't there. And as you can see, we are doing it locally and we're doing it year round. And so many research uh, areas in the world usually work in the summer or work when the sea is nice. When you work locally, with local people that are out there in the sea every day or when the, when the, day, when the sea is nice, then you collect data year round, which is a good, which, and then we have a good effort year round. We can say something year round, not just periodically or seasonally. And uh, on average, we go about uh, once every week, as you can see more or less here, this is the average. And as you can see, 2017 hasn't ended yet, but we have a very uh, large peak of surveys. It's not because we're going more, it's because we have entered, we had with luck to have two very talented volunteers. And those talented volunteers, they said, uh, look, you can do your science better if you use our knowledge in creating technology. And there are people that come from the industry that work with apps and databases and so on. And they created for us an app on a mobile phone. It's only Android, but it's, a, it's, it's an app which can be Anybody can work with it, more or less. We have two forms for it. One, one is for researchers, and one is for observers, which is not a researcher. And then less data is being collected, but still valuable effort data can be collected. So this is our app. And um, what we collect, we collect effort data, which is a very straightforward C condition, more or less. We collect the way, where we are searching, and if we're searching. And since we're out there, we collect also other very valuable information in biodiversity of everything that we see above the water. So it could be flying fish, it could be seabirds, it could be um, other fish that we can see above water, jellyfish, which is quite a, um, is a thing that you can see and interest the public, and so on. Uh, recently, we've also entered the microplastic um, tab to it, so we can also collect plastic uh, that we see out there. 
And uh, this is data that uh, shows the effort. And as you can see, the effort is being centered in a few areas. Usually, this, is, this main spot is where there are two big marinas in, uh, in Israel. And the access through the sailing boats and, uh, is much easier. That's why we have a very nice effort. Um, this is a new map that uh, is just from 1917, from the new app that we've uh, uh, created. And uh, by the way, this is Israel. Uh, this is the north, as you can see, a very nice neighborhood we have there. Uh, but we operate uh, all around, also near the Gaza Strip, near the Lebanon areas. Uh, we operate all around the city. With We have here a marina, here a marina, and here a marina, and there where we have more um, effort there. When we see a dolphin, then we collect standard data information. Obviously, we take photo ID. Uh, so that we can know the dolphins and follow them uh, individually. We know about 150 dolphins along the Israeli coast. Some of them, we see them quite frequently. Some of them, we see them just passing by. And um, this is some um, um, an analyzation that we've done in 2012. As, as you can see, um, you have to go quite a long way before you see a group of dolphins in Israel. It's not something you just uh, go out there like, the, I don't know, in Sarasota and so on, that you just go out and you see the dolphins. In Israel, it's not the case. Uh, the, the effort is uh, you have to go more or less 55 kilometers of going out to the sea before you see a pod of dolphins. So you, have, you must be very motivated to do this. And it's not really, it might not be, uh, very good for a pure uh, touristic attraction, but still we can get people out there and, and do some dolphin watching. Um, we see them year round, so they're all there, year round they're there, no significant uh, differences between the season, so we call them Israeli dolphins, they are there with us. Maybe they go out to the Gaza Strip or to Lebanon, but we see them around us year round. We mainly see bottlenose dolphins. We also see common dolphins, mainly in the south, close to Gaza Strip, which is quite interesting. This is quite new phenomena, about 50 dolphins. Also very young calf there. And our connection to Barcelona is through this, this guy. Well, I don't know if it's a male or a female, but it's a gray whale that we suddenly saw, this is uh, the center, this is Tel Aviv, this is the center of Israel, the middle of Israel, just beside the coast. This gray, gray whale suddenly appeared. It was quite shocking because gray whales were never seen in the Mediterranean and they were extinct from the Atlantic Ocean about 400 years ago. And uh, first thing when I saw this and I took this picture, I thought it's a sperm whale. Sorry, Eric, but... <laughs> The guide wasn't there with me, but it looked strange. I thought, oh, this is a strange sperm whale. Um, but then when I looked back home at the guide, I understood that it's not a sperm whale. And uh, after 22 days, it reappeared here in Barcelona, just crossed whoosh, straight. So today when I went in the morning to the med, I had to look at the med in the morning. Uh, before I came here, I was thinking about this gray whale coming all over like I did. Uh, last night. Um, but this swim, this swim, this, so it's very exciting when we had a small paper on this with Manel and so on, and it was in Clara, and so it was nice. Uh, we collect standard data. It's not very important here, but uh, in this app, also uh, the group size um, and different parameters to do with behavior uh, that we collect with the app, and then we can analyze them. And uh, what we see here is uh, effort-based uh, sightings. And uh, each number here is the number of dolphins that we saw in each square. And uh, what you can see from here, it, the details are not important, but what you can see here is that where we have, have effort, a lot of effort, we see a lot of dolphins. So there is not really a very um, distinct hotspot. Uh, down in the south here, there are some fish cages, open water, so this might be a small hotspot, but it's not uh, 
um, that definite. So they're going out there and um, what we know from the data is uh, that we, um, this is a graph of effort against sightings and the dolphins stay more from 40 to 80 meters than from close to coast. So here in Israel, or here, not here, but in Israel, um, sighting from the coast is not very, um, not something that happens quite often. So in Israel, if you want to see the dolphins, we have to go out there and see them with boats. Uh, and, and this is the distinct when we did a, a significant difference. Average group size is about six animals, which is quite usual for bottlenose dolphins, uh, but we see um, many of them go either alone or just a mother and calf. And, um, and we see them uh, a lot doing a lot of foraging, doing foraging uh, uh, behind trawlers, like you see here in, uh, in this area. Uh, this is a very common phenomenon, and this is what I did for my PhD. Um, I'm not going to go through all the scientific stuff. I don't think it's appropriate for this for you. Uh, what I'm very proud of, uh, as Eric mentioned, for us this EMA process was uh, very important and um, and from a group of crazy people that are going out there to look for dolphins and say, look, there are dolphins here to the government and institute, now we have a stamp, a trademark, that uh, says, look, this is an important area. It is done by the IUCN. And uh, so for us, it is very important. Obviously, it was very fun to build Manel and other guys in uh, Crete there. Um, but. This is the sea emma that we, uh, for the bottlenose dolphin and the common dolphin, and in, in the end, uh, we got one emma for the two species, which combined the two, and this is very, very important for us from the conservation point of view and from the monitoring point of view, and hopefully we'll get more money to do some real monitoring because since we don't have much effort here, then, we, don't, we didn't uh, have the, enough data to declare those as emas, but I'm sure that they're important for other um, species, and I hope we will be able to do that. Um, for us, it's very important as an NGO to go and do outreach, educational stuff. So we've created a, an education center, a very minimal budget education center with some uh, whales uh, skeletons that we have, some nice pictures that were donated to us, sculptures. And uh, we speak to the children and tell them what we have in our sea, show them pictures, show the movies and so on, it, and it's working very well. And, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get some more fundings to have some more exciting stuff in it and bring more people into it. And I would like to end, so far I was speaking about um, general, the population, but the exciting thing about it, and especially when, you're, when you think about outreach, is getting the people to know the dolphins themselves. And this is what, when you go out there and you look at the dolphin, I think it's very crucial. And I will, there, we have many stories like this. I just picked one, one female. We called her Ziggy. We called her Ziggy because she has this zigzag here. This, we first saw her in 2005, and uh, we saw her with the young calf, and we called her, called her, at the time we didn't know it's her, zigzag. And uh, as you can see from following them in, in, a, in a, a precise manner, you can follow them and see if they have some skin lesion or some other stuff, so you can assess the welfare as well. There was a question about welfare. And uh, Zigzag was a star, uh, like to be pictured. And this is a year later, uh, 2006, you see that Zigzag had a skin lesion as well, similar to his mother. And uh, this is two years later, still this, but is better, obviously. And the last sighting with, uh, with his mother was in 2008, which means that he stayed with his mother for, she, actually it's a female, she stayed with, his mo with her mother for three years. Um, 
And then we saw her uh, in the southern part of Israel, in really near the coast of Gaza uh, in uh, 2011. Uh, as you can see, females, they don't get much scars because they don't fight as much as males. Um, and the last time we saw her was with, uh, with her mother again, back with her mother in 2012. And that was her, the last sighting. Maybe she's there, but we didn't see her since then. Back to Ziggy, when uh, Zigzag left her, she had another calf. 2008, which means she had 2005 calf, 2008 calf, which means she is quite in good condition that she can give birth every three years. Um, and we called the calf Zygmunt. And uh, we didn't know at the time that it's a male, but we'll see if it's a male or a female soon. And uh, this two years later, in 2010, Zygmunt is a young calf doing some problem, and his mother is telling him off for that. And uh, a male or a female Zygmunt? A male. A male dolphin. And this is his mother. Zigz As you can see, the dorsal fin stays very similar along those years. And um, and then in 2011, we saw Ziggy without Zygmunt. Again, three years, she left the calf, or the calf left her. And uh, our last sighting was just a month ago uh, of her. She's still around, not with the calf, but she's still around. And to end this story, I'll just show you the difference between a male and a female. So Zygmunt is a male, as we saw. And as you know, males, they get their scars going fighting around. So he's fighting with other dolphins. This is the, the, the um, teeth marks of other dolphins fighting over something. They like to fight those males. I don't know why. Uh, and uh, this is the, uh, no, the, we saw, uh, this is also interesting. We saw uh, Ziggy without, sorry, uh, Zygmunt without Ziggy. And we had a sighting of him um, this sighting was of Zygmunt, which is three years old, totally alone. And which means that he's feeling quite safe and comfortable going alone. We don't have much big sharks that can predate that, that pred those, so, so he was happy to, to be alone and look for food. Um, this was the last sighting. I don't know where he went, but he probably went somewhere good. We have a project of Adopt a Dolphin, and, um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Aviat, for Gracias por, gracias por haberte enseñat el temps i gràcies per l'explicació d'aquests estudis llargs d'aquesta població concreta i també la història de, de l'Así i els seus familiars. Em sembla que hi ha una mica de temps per preguntes. Si algú té una pregunta... Um, well, thank you, Aviat, for, for this interesting talk. Um, Two very short questions. Uh, first one is, uh, if do you have an um, abundance estimate of the border nose population, coastal border nose population uh, in front of Israel? And second one is, if you have observed any fisheries interaction um, in this uh, population? Okay. Thank you. So we have, uh, we have recognized 150 dolphins. We have an estimate of abundance of about uh, 300. Uh, we know that they go also offshore, or at least we have an also offshore uh, population, but we don't explore it that often because of budget and the accessibility of both. Uh, so this is more or less our rough estimate for the population, 100, between 150 to 300. And there is a very strong interaction with bottom trolling a very, very strong, all calving females, we see them at least once, new bottle trawling, feeding, 
Most of them, we see them the entire times. So we have some children that we only see them with calves behind bottom trolling, which means that they get food there. We have some bycatch in bottom trolling, uh, which happens not very often, but happens in a, in a, once in a while. And we have some bycatch in gill nets. Not too often, though. Y había dos preguntas más. Hello, I'm David from the Pana and Cetacea Associations. We are a bit concerned because of the follow-up and monitoring um, policies of cetaceans. We are working here to to try and make compatible protected areas, which are important, but it would be important to us too to protect cetaceans as mobile animals inside and outside of these areas. And I would like to know if in your area you have a sustainable approximation or sustainable approaching um, policy or something to approach cetaceans. Uh, as I said, we don't have a specific hotspot, natural hotspot, that uh, the dolphins stay there and not in other places. They are very mobile all along the coast. Where we go out, we see them. So in this matter, when, when we speak about uh, marine protected areas or no fishery areas, uh, the idea is to conserve some areas and through this, you conserve also the dolphins that pass through there. But it's not, or in, it's not directed to the dolphins, it's directed to the habitat, as Eric said. And through the habitat, we conserve the dolphins that are there and feeding there. Last question, please. Hello, I'm Claudia from the Zoo 21 platform. I would like to know if at your NGO you have any educational project for citizens and for children specifically. Yeah, actually the, the only uh, people that get uh, salaries, that get money from the NGO are dealing with education. This is the only uh, money that we can secure. So we have this educational center, which is a very important uh, um, anchor for the educational work. We bring children from kindergarten all the way to high school. We do also um, laboratory work with them, with the high school, and we do more um, fun work with, with the little children. And the idea of this center is looking at the sea through the eyes of the dolphins. So this is the perspective that our NGO looks at the sea, and this is the perspective of this educational center. So when we, when we go into the center, and the little children, they really they wear uh, like a dorsal fin, so they feel like a dolphin, and we explain the entire ecosystem as the dolphins see it, the sound, who is the, their, um, what do they feed on, the marine environment that they depend upon, and so on, and then we get to the top predators that are around them, and the dolphin, the coastal dolphin, the offshore, and in the end, we speak about the dangers of the dolphins, and we have a net that we show the dolphins, we show the children why dolphins get attached to the net and they cannot swim backwards and, and get released and so on. So we, we show them all of this, and, and do, do we also speak about plastics and the problem of plastic bags and so on, so that there will be a take-home message through this, and it's working very nice. I must say that the children are mostly uh, excited by the physiology, but the physiology of this marine mammal, how it survives in the sea, and they, they can sit for an hour. It's amazing, those active children with all those iPhones and so on, they sit for an hour and listen to how a dolphin, a marine mammal, can survive at the sea. So don't underestimate those children. Okay, uh, thank you, Viet. Thank you. Okay, so far, the Q&A. Thank you. Okay, let's see if this works. Apologies for the icon that you're seeing. We'll try to call Juan Gonzalo. Are you there, Juan? 
Hola, Joan, em sents? Hola, Joan, can you hear me? Vale, hauries de compartir pantalla, d'acord? Sí, ara mateix. Please share your screen, your screen with us. Joan Gonsalvo is a researcher, like Avia Deschenin, they are two people who have done their PhD with um, bottlenose dolphin populations. He is a Catalan guy, but he works for the um, research institution that you can see on screen. He's working on a Ionian dolphin project with a very well-known um, population of bottlenose dolphin. And he will tell us the perspective of the Tethys Research Institute, um, the continuous studies that they conduct on this population, and then the awareness and citizen participation activities. 20 minutes, Juan. Give me a second, because I have a, an issue with my audio. Let me change my headset. Everything was prepared, I can assure you, beforehand, but, well, since time is on our side, it's okay. Can you hear me okay, okay? Juan says. It's better it's to, if you want to switch to English, and, and we will serve your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Abans de res, m'agradaria agrair... Well, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Let me thank the organizers for the invitation, which is a very relevant workshop, this one, because of the situation that we have in Barcelona. I'm from Barcelona. Unfortunately, I could not make it to Barcelona for this workshop, so thanks to technology, I can participate. Let me now move on to a presentation that will be delivered in English. And as Manel said, I work in Greece with the Tethys um, Research and Institute. And now I will switch to English, okay? So I, I would like also to, to give my greetings to a lot of uh, friends that are over there. Uh, I think that we will have to choose another occasion to finally meet. Um, so I'm going to focus on this. Uh, the presentation is about bottlenose dolphins in the Gulf of Ambrasia. This is, in, this is in Western Greece, in the Ionian Sea. Oops, I don't know. Okay, okay. So um, this is a project that is run by Tethys Research Institute, which is a, an NGO that has been doing uh, study and conservation of marine mammals in the Mediterranean for over 30 years. Uh, throughout these years and different projects, we use, uh, we use different platforms and we work in different study areas. Um, we, uh, uh, among the, the different techniques that we use are surveys at sea, but also aerial surveys and sampling of uh, tissue of animals to look at genetics, contamination, etc. And we have, at Tethys, we have two long-term research and conservation projects, which both of them have been going on for over 25 years. In this case, I'm going to put one is uh, here on the, on the left. You can see in Liguria the Cetacean Sanctuary Research Project and the one that I'll be focusing on uh, in the Ionian Sea. So in the Ionian Sea, we are working in areas, the Gulf of Ambrasia, where I'm right now. I'm in this village of Vonitza. Uh, this morning, I just came back from the sea. So if I mumble a little bit, uh, excuse me, because, you know, I had a, quite a lot of sun during the survey today, and it's just 20 minutes that I'm in this chair. I've been in the sea until very recently. Um, and then the other study area that we have is the Honor Ionian Sea Archipelago. I will be focusing for this presentation on bottlenose dolphins in the Gulf of Ambrasia. Within the project of the Ionian Dolphin Project, we try to identify the most significant threats affecting coastal dolphins and obviously to discuss and to elucidate adequate conservation measures in order to secure the survival of these animals in the increasing fragile waters. So in the Gulf of Ambrasia, we have exclusively bottled dolphins, which is a common dolphin, but by now we can forget about the common and refer to them as bottled dolphins, the Turcius truncatus. This is an animal that is known to all of us, so I will go through the details of the species. And the research methods that in the Ionian Dolphin Project we are implementing are both way surveys, uh, in which once we encounter dolphins, like this morning, we do behavioral data collection, we establish who is there, the composition of the group, so how many newborns, how many calves, how many juveniles, 
how many adults. Actually, this morning we were dealing with a group of initially seven dolphins, then some others that were farther away joined in. We end up with a group of 10 dolphins, seven adults, two juveniles, one calf. And we are doing extensive work with photo identification. Here you just have a small sample of my colleague and friend, Aviat, I think that he already mentioned about photo ID. But we have, uh, this is just a, a small sample of the animals that are more distinguishable, more, more highly marked. So through these marks, we are able to follow the history of these animals. Uh, here is just an example of the evolution of an animal that is well known to us. Uh, how the dorsal fin evolved through 2002 until 2004. This is actually one of the animals that we saw yesterday. We call it Michalis, because Michalis is a local friend of mine, a fisherman that is quite old, and he has also big scars. So I thought about Michalis when, when I saw this Boronos dolphin. And then this is just something that I, I added very quickly this slide just 10 minutes ago, because this morning we saw one of the dolphins that was with us was Samurai. Samurai is this dolphin that you can see in this slide. Uh, in 2015, we saw it in a very poor condition. You can see on the top of the slide a big scar. Uh, I mean, the animal was in very bad condition. Uh, we didn't see it for several months, so I was assuming that the animal didn't survive to these injuries. But luckily enough, last year, in 2016, we saw it. Uh, it's amazing how these scars have healed and how he has overcome this condition. And this morning we saw it again. We have seen it for a few times uh, this year. But anyway, it's good news to, to see Samurai, and we wanted to share this with you guys. Uh, another uh, approach that we do uh, in, the, in the project is the ecosystem modeling. So we explore the ecosystem's structure and functioning, basically to look at the impact of fishing and how the ecosystem would respond to a changing environment as a result of the different anthropogenic activities that uh, dolphin suffer in this area. We also do a large interviews, uh, a large number of interviews to local fishermen to gain their ecological knowledge. This is uh, a unique opportunity for us to get their insights into past abundance of fish, changes in ecosystem status, quality, uh, understand their perception on dolphin fisheries and, and dolphin and fisheries interaction, and also. Uh, understand what is their perception uh, as fishermen towards dolphins. We have seen that throughout the years, the perception not only of fishermen, of the society in general towards cetaceans has changed quite dramatically. In this, uh, this uh, slide, you can see a few pieces of newspapers of the early 60s here in Greece where uh, when dolphins were still considered like a plague because the way they were breaking the nets of the fishermen. So here you see, for instance, at the bottom of the slide, they are referring to specifically to our study area, the Gulf of Ambracia or Ambracicos, as I prefer to refer to, which is the Greek name. So in the Gulf of Ambracicos, they were reporting 3,000 dolphins um, devouring and, and knee preying on the nets of the fishermen and the poor fishermen struggling to keep their nets safe. Um, so, you know, the evolution uh, of the attitude towards these animals has changed quite dramatically. So in the Ambracicos Gulf, as I will refer to it, because that's the Greek name for it, we have one of the highest densities of bottlenose dolphins, uh, oops, one of the bottlenose dolphins anywhere in the Mediterranean. We have very favorable conditions to study the dolphins in the wild because the, the prevailing sea conditions are mostly calm. We work with primarily with very calm seas because of the enclosure of the Gulf provides natural shelter, shelter from, from the predominant winds. Sea turtles are also very abundant, loggerhead sea turtles, careta careta, and it's not rare to see them on the seafront when fishermen are coming on the seafront to do their landings and to, to sell their fish when they are mending and cleaning their nets. There are sardines and other fish that are uh, thrown or accidentally fell overboard from the boats and, the, and loggerheads locally have learned to take advantage of that attitude. We have a large diversity of seabirds of different species uh, and also the seabirds interact frequently with bottlenose dolphins. Bottlenose dolphins in this area have developed uh, some um, behavioral adaptations. 
which have allowed us to establish that they are preying primarily on epipelagic fish, the fish that lives at the surface. And is frequently, we frequently encounter them feeding at the surface. Uh, and in this image, for instance, you see, I don't know if it's visible, I will try to point it with the, with the arrow here. There is a sardine, and this bottlenose dolphin is just pushing it with its belly towards the surface. And this seagull here is very clever, waiting for the dolphins basically to bring the fish to the surface so they have to, so they don't need to dive as deep to steal the fish or to catch the fish from the dolphins. We have done our abundance estimate based, based on photo identification, and we have a roughly about 150 bottlenose dolphins in the area. We know by now that this is a subpopulation, it's a population unit that is genetically isolated from other uh, populations of the same species around this area. And we have seen also, although in this image you may see a slight decrease on the population numbers, this is not significant in terms, in statistical terms. So we will see, uh, we will see how um, throughout the years how this situation will evolve. We hope that this will be stable, but we will see what happens. I would like to emphasize that here you have in this image date is re is referred to 10 years of data between 2006 and 2015. But in the Gulf of Ambracicos, we started to work in 2001, and we intend to stay for some more years to, to, and so on. In the other study area, in, in the Inner Ionian Archipelago, we work since 1991. As I said, the Ionian Dolphin Project is going on for more than 25 years. This is just to show you very briefly, because it's basically a big mess if you don't get it close enough. This is just to illustrate the residency pattern of our dolphins, or some of them. You see that each one of those columns reflects when an animal was spotted. So when you see a gray cell or a dark cell, that means that the dolphin that is referred to in each line was present on that sampling occasion, which is one month of surveys. So you see that there aren't many gaps that throughout the, the study period, a lot of animals are showing a very strong site fidelity. The ones that you see fading away throughout the years are animals that probably didn't make it, they died, and therefore we haven't seen them again. But this is the kind of data that we can get from a long-term project with intense effort and with lots of photo identification effort. So bottlenose dolphins in the Gulf of Ambragicos, they thrive where because prey is very abundant and competition is low. By competition low, I mean that here in the Gulf of Ambracicos, only small-scale fishermen are allowed to operate. We don't have industrial fisheries like bottom trawlers, for seiners, and stuff like that. So we just have these small wooden boats, uh, family-run business, and so on. So this is very sustainable. So while local uh, density of dolphins is among one of the highest recorded anywhere else in the Mediterranean, this is by no means, and I would like to emphasize this, this by no means indicates favorable conservation of stat of status of the species or pristine habitat. The highly resident population of dolphins in the Gulf of Ambracicos is at risk due to their small population size and to their reproductive isolation and to acute and growing anthropogenic impacts that I will quickly review. This is a satellite image of the Gulf of Ambracicos. This is where we were doing our survey this morning. We actually left from Vonitsa. I don't know if you see this arrow, but this is where we have our field base. We left, we did a series of zigzags here following our transects. We encountered a group of dolphins around here. We stayed of them for a couple of hours, and then we came back because I had an appointment with you guys. So here we have the, the mouth of Ambracicos. You can see that it really jumps to your eye that the connection between the Gulf of Ambracicos and the open waters of the Ionian Sea are, is, is very unique, is very narrow. And if we zoom on that image, you see here that this is the only connection with the open sea is this corridor, which is the channel of Preveza, which right now is only 300 and, uh, 370 meters wide and is as shallow as four meters. I don't know if you notice, but there is a big marina here that was built in the late 90s and was finalized in 2000. So before this marina, this kind of appendix was added to the mouth of the Gulf. The mouth of the Gulf was about 700 meters wide, but now because of human action has been reduced by half. 
We have also an issue related to the rivers that uh, reach the Gulf, that there have been a lot of, of dams and for hydroelectricity and to irrigate the harvest fields in the north of the Gulf. So we, um, the input of fresh water in the ecosystem has been also quite dramatically reduced. On top of this, we have intensive fish farming and very poor sewage treatment, if any, in most of the villages around the Gulf. So the Gulf is facing a situation of eutrophication, which, which is leading to bottom anoxy and heavy pollution. By bottom anoxy, obviously, I mean that uh, the deeper layers of the Gulf of Aprakikos are not so deep. Actually, the recent studies have shown that waters deeper than 20 meters have a concentration of oxygen equal to zero. So in front of this situation of degradation, uh, our dolphins, let's say our dolphins, allow me to say our dolphins, bottlenose dolphins in the Gulf, are manifesting some epidermal, epidermic uh, conditions. So one out of every three dolphins suffers some kind of a skin condition, which falls into one of these six categories. Particularly acute is the case of the one at the bottom right, the white dot category, in which we have seen animals that have these almost mummified aspect. It looks like a spread fungi, fungi uh, throughout their skin. But you can see these animals, again, through photo identification, we've been able to spot, oops, excuse me. We've been able to see that these animals that were in such a condition, in an acute condition already in 2003 and 2005, they are still, they are still alive. We see them, although this illustration goes back to 2012, I still have seen these animals in the past few years and also in 2017. What is interesting also to notice is we always see the same sequence. We always go from mild to uh, from mild from mild to moderate and increasingly severe condition. We haven't had any case that a dolphin has gone from severe to mild and then fading away completely and getting and getting good looking again, so to say. So just to, to put you in context of the legal framework of Ambrakikos, this is this is an this is an area where the northern part of the Gulf is a considered important for seabirds, etc., etc. There are a, a, a different terminology, different designations within the EU that have recognized the importance of the northern shore of the Gulf of Ambrakikos. But then recently, uh, the Gulf of Ambrakikos was designated national park. We thought, well, this is this is good news. But unfortunately, the text that was referring to the National Park of Ambrakikos didn't do any mention to the presence of bottlenose dolphins or any recognition to the presence of sea turtles. So the national park that was established again in 2009 uh, is referring to the usage that the people can do around the land, around the Gulf, but doesn't do any, doesn't give any particular mention to the waters of the Gulf themselves. The good news is that last summer, last year, about a year ago, there was a review of Natura 2000 areas in Greece and largely, thank you, Manel, for the five minutes call, <laughs> uh, and largely uh, thanks to our efforts and to all the reports that we have uh, presented to the Greek ministries and to the evidence gathered in almost two decades of work in the Gulf of Ambrakikos, now the new, the new recognition of the, the new extension of the Natura 2000 area for the Gulf of Ambrakikos will be covering all the waters of the Gulf of the Gulf of Ambrakikos, and it is given particular attention to the fact that there is Careta Careta, Loggerhead Sea Turtles, and Tursius Truncatus, Boronox Dolphins. So the priority for the Gulf of Malaysia should pay attention to deal with eutrophication and pollution in this increasingly vulnerable ecosystem. Until now, we've been talking about science, but I would like to mention that within this project, there is a lot of, oh, a lot of, there is much more going on. This is a citizen science project, which means that we welcome volunteers and project participants from different nationalities that have, that join us for one week, two or more, and they help us to collect our data. We try to convey a certain conservation message to them. So we believe that in a way, uh, in a way this helps to spread the word about conservation and to raise awareness to those participants join us, then go back home, talk with their families and friends, and so on. The word spreads around. Locally, we have been doing also 
uh, a large number of activities. Uh, we call Dolphin Day, this celebration that we do more or less in yearly basis, in which we update the local population about our work, about our fundings, about the need to preserve the Gulf and the nature of the Gulf. We do a large number of presentations in local schools, in support of the different organizations. We have one also beach cleaning events. So there is quite a lot of stuff going on. We try to provide information and provide educational materials to the local schools, uh, multimedia, multimedia stuff. We have also participated in a large project, the European project to raise awareness on marine mammals in Greece. And most importantly, and I'm particularly proud of this, the relationship that we have managed to establish with the local community and more particularly with the fishermen community. I mean, some of these fishermen that today are very friendly, when I first came here 15 years ago, were kind of threatening us because we were the dolphin guys and they were not very keen on dolphins, if you know what I mean. So they were initially suspicious, even aggressive sometimes when we arrived with our with our ideas, with our boat, and we started to do our surveys and our Dolphin Day events. Luckily enough, the situation has changed. Now we are sharing information. And I'm happy to say that this offers a unique opportunity to gain first-hand information from these guys. This is, as an example, the guy that you see here in this picture. This is the picture that, to me, represents the Mediterranean. And this is what we should be preserving, the small wooden boats working at, at sunset, and this is the postcard. This is what I would like to see when I close my eyes and I think about the Mediterranean. In this case, this guy is Barbayanis. Barbayanis is only 91 years old. He's been all his life fishing in the Gulf of Ambrakikos. Until last year, this, taken, this photo was taken last year, he was going without engine, just rowing with his strong arms and setting the nets down with his bare hands until last year. So he is a living encyclopedia about the Gulf of Ambraticos. And there is a lot of stuff that we can learn from people like Barbayanis and others. Uh, just to, to finish, because the time is running, I want to mention also that in terms to raise awareness, we're not only covering the local community, which is very important, but also we are using our new website to provide information to boaters and to companies that are providing um, charter uh, sailing boats, etc. In the Ionian Sea is one of the most sought after destination for sailing and recreation boating. There are in average easily more than a thousand boats that are rented on weekly basis and they go north and south everywhere around the, the, the Ionian Sea. So we encounter those boats at sea very often. They approach us where they see us doing our stuff with the dolphins. So we decided that it was worthy to establish some kind of platform so these people, when they go out at sea, can share their sightings with us. And we can also provide them information on how it's best to behave when they encounter dolphins at sea. So every single boat that is operated in the area by different companies throughout the Ionian, all the companies that are operating in the Ionian, have been contacted by the Ionian Dolphin Project, and all of them have on board the basic guidelines on how to behave when they encounter dolphins at sea. And also, they have uh, the species guide that I showed earlier. Let's go back. On the species that they can find in the Mediterranean or in the Ionian waters, in this case, in the Greek waters, in this case. And easily online, they can report, they can report it to us is uh, obviously widespread the use of, of smartphones that allow to take photos and videos, etc. So through our, our website, they also can share those photos and videos. This is just a, a quick snapshot of the latest uh, of the latest about, about 200 sightings that the latest sightings that have been reported to us online. And basically, I wanted to emphasize the importance with my talk. Basically, I wanted to emphasize the importance of long term research not only from the, from the scientific point of view, but most importantly, from the awareness and involvement of the community point of view. If we do short-term projects that we go do, go do a snapshot and disappear, it's very difficult to involve the community and to involve the citizenship on what we're doing and to transfer certain values. Once said that, 
I hope that in the World Conference that will be held in Barcelona in December 2019, we will hear from some projects going on in our Catalan coast. And that's it. Thank you very much. Moltes gràcies. Uh, thank you, Joan. Uh, we will try, or we have two minutes for questions. Uh, if there is anyone who wants to ask, okay. I don't hear anything. I only hear you, Manel. Oh. Hola. You're going to have uh, to transfer the information sí. if possible. Hi, I'm Marta Guma. I belong to the IPANA Association. Wait, wait a minute, Joan. It's very difficult to understand anything. Okay, I, I will translate that. Okay. Yeah, sure. One of the suggestions for dolphins at the Barcelona Zoo was to be transferred to a sanctuary at the Gipsos uh, Greek island. I'm sure you know about it. The position of my group regarding this is that as there is a, a population, uh, well, then that might endanger uh, this uh, transfer. So I wanted to know your opinion as an expert of this suggestion. I don't know really now what, whether it's been ruled out completely. I think it has, but uh, I'm very interested to know as an expert, what, what do you think about transferring the Barcelona Zoo dolphins there? Joan, the question about the sanctuary, Ipsos, where there was uh, presence of seals and other mammals. As you're an expert, what's your opinion about transferring the Barcelona Zoo dolphins over there? We know there's going to be discussions session later on, we're going to talk about Ipsos specifically. So, Joan, just tell us, what about mixing different species? And that would have to be the end of this session. Well, listen, for those of you who know me, I don't know if it's better whether I speak in Catalan or English, I'll speak, uh, I'm sure you have simultaneous translation, so I'll speak Catalan if you allow me. Listen, my opinion is well known. I'm not so much against, but at least not in favor of captivity. I'm somebody who studies cetaceans in their natural habitat, and that is the best way, I believe, for them. They have to be kept free. Yes, indeed, this is a situation of, of some urgency, because the attitude of the general public is changing, and it's uh, increasingly difficult to justify the presence of dolphins in captivity in a, in a, in a tank. So, so, of course, I think it's good to look for alternatives, and such alternatives mean establishing sanctuaries, uh, or at least what people call sanctuaries. In fact, I'm part of the commission of one of these initiatives, uh, the uh, sanctuary project um, with Naomi Rose and Lori Marino, who participate. They'll, um, I'm sure they'll be able to explain better than, than, than I. But I do, I am in favor of sanctuaries, but having said this, I don't think that all sanctuaries are adequate. One has to be scientifically rigorous, there has to be a logistic commitment, and most especially a financial commitment in order to maintain such a long-term project. It wouldn't really be good for anyone, and even less for the dolphins, to actually transfer them to some facilities uh, or to a certain island somewhere in which initially, yes, uh, it all might be very interesting and it might kind of make people feel very kind of happy about it. But you have to think that these animals live for many, many years. They easily live 40 years. And even, well, in the best uh, study we have of this species, we know that there are some bottlenose dolphins that have lived to the age of 60. So you can't look for short-term solutions. And this makes everything more complicated. So what I would ask is that when any suggestion or assessment of a sanctuary is analyzed and talked about, let's 
see who's there, who's giving support and what are the conditions, but not only for a good beginning. It's not the initial situation that we're interested in, but rather that this goes on for decades. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, for your answer. Thank you, Marta, for opening this box that we'll go back to this afternoon. Anyway, so thank you, Joanne. It's been great having you with us through Skype. Go back to sea. We'll stay here on land. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Good work, everyone. See you. I would kindly ask you not to leave for lunch yet because uh, we're going to be having uh, somebody speaking to us, Miss Janet Santh, who is the deputy an elder woman at the Barcelona City Council for Urban Issues and Habitat. So she has the floor and she will be giving a closing address before we go for lunch. After that, we're going to be meeting again this afternoon at uh, 15.00, that is 3 o'clock, 3 p.m. sharp. <laughs> she was here, I promise. Uh, she was here. We'll wait for her to come. Are you all okay? Yeah? Yeah, well, it seems that Janet Santh is coming. So thank you very much. Janet Santh will be closing this morning's session. And we are happy that she was able to come. Thank you. Well, hello. Mm, good morning. I've been doing a million things today, believe me. And I don't even know if this is the morning or the afternoon. But anyway, good day to you all. First of all, I have to say thank you from the heart for having been here this morning, talking, thinking, analyzing on the basis of one of the most important decisions that uh, we believe in at the city level as well. But before I explain what the reason is behind the decision that the Barcelona City Council made and the work that we are actually carrying out to implement the decision, I would like to address some words in English to the people who are here who came from abroad. You are all helping us do this work better. And it's great that the group of Carmen, Frederic, uh, well, it's great that they were able to organize this. So I will begin addressing these friends. As a deputy mayor for ecology, urbanize and mobility, I would like to welcome you to our city, to Barcelona. It's a great pleasure for us to host this international uh, workshop in our city. All of you already know that in, on December uh, 2016, Barcelona declared itself to be a city without 
captive dolphins, where the majority of the councillors of the city hall approving the, uh, this uh, status. At the same right now, uh, Barcelona Zoo, which is public facilities, you know, holds six captive dolphins. They are, they are in inadequate facilities, and for this, uh, the municipality has decided to re relocate them. Now it's time to determine which criteria need be taken into consideration uh, where we're doing this relocation. Sitting proper criteria will be, of course, extremely useful for us, but also to many other cities and countries which uh, are in, in similar situation like us. So I, will, I would like to send you a very clear uh, message. Your advice will be very much appreciated here in Barcelona, but also in all over the world. It will not be easy, sure, I'm sure. But I'm sure too, uh, you will manage to produce a very interesting and highly appreciated advice. Thanks, very thanks uh, in advance. Now I change uh, to Catalan to explain our decision and our situation. As I was saying at the beginning, our city is a city with a long institutional and uh, citizen action platform. We believe in animals' rights. For more than 20 years already, Barcelona and the City Council, but most especially uh, with a number of platforms, has uh, included motions of different groups, and we have actively promoted different initiatives and policies to work for animals' rights. Let me highlight some of them. In 1996, the Municipal Council for Living Together and Defending and Protecting Animals was started. 1998 was a year of the Municipal Declaration for Animals' Rights, acknowledging precisely that all animals, never mind the species, have the right to be respected and should not be victims of abuse, of violence, effort, violent shows, or cruel action that would uh, generate uh, harm and damage. In 1983, the presence of wild animals was forbidden in circus. In 2004, six years before the rest of Catalonia, Barcelona forbade um, issues and races of bulls in the region. 2006 was the year of a specific headquarters of an office promoting protection of animals in the city of Barcelona. 2014 was the year of the, the municipal decree forbidding um, trading with certain species as pets, and that meant the incorporation of actions and uh, bans and rulings. And 2015 was the year for the Barcelona City Council to start on what we are dealing with today. It was the first decision of stopping shows that had dolphins in Barcelona. That meant the Barcelona Zoo. And then last year, 2016, was a year in which the declaration came of Barcelona as a city free of uh, dolphins in captivity. I've, I've given you this very short uh, history so that you can see where we are right now as a city and where we want to go. Barcelona has never been too complacent about the way it dealt with uh, its animals. And Barcelona always wanted to improve that and make headway regarding rights of animals and protection of animals, as many other cities are doing, actually, in other places of the world. This is what has made us able to be very much aware of this uh, this avenue. We knew that as a, as a municipal group, we had to make strategic decisions. Something else that we started, and we have the presence of the new director of the Zoo of Barcelona, Cito Alarcón, more precisely was how to restart or redefine what the zoo is that the city of Barcelona wants to have, and what this zoo should be that will make us proud as Barcelona citizens to make sure we have a zoo that links with the animals and with the other cities in the world. We are working precisely on this new zoo model. We want it to reflect this change in values and ethics that, 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 that is happening everywhere and that the citizens are asking for, too. We want the zoo of our city to be the main sustainable facility of Barcelona right from the beginning, from the moment people go through the door and leave uh, through the exit. The whole of the Barcelona Zoo has to convey the values of the zoo, and that is to have 
have life at its center, the life of people, the life of animals. And because of that, uh, what is essential is uh, that we learn about species that has to be present all the time. We want a zoo based uh, as well on education and training. And that's why this uh, future model of the Zoo of Barcelona that we're all working on, and we are involving workers at the zoo, different experts, not only local experts, but people from elsewhere, politicians, different NGOs working for animals, animal rights. We are all working now on, on specific points, and very soon we'll be putting forward a suggestion of a strategic plan as to what changes have to take place to effectively implement this idea, so that conservation and uh, education and training are the engine of the zoo. And this is something that I always like to mention as one of the most important elements. It means to redefine, to rethink, reflect on the collection idea. I remember when I was a kid, yeah, collecting things. Uh, it could be collecting images, stamps, and even animals. It was all the rage. But the zoo is not an animal collection. It's not just collecting per se. So we move away from the classical idea of animal collection that we had inherited uh, from the 19th century. So really, we believed it was an essential thing to take into account. So this is our horizon to make sure it's an, an important environmental facility of the city, right from the first door to the last. And uh, being consistent with all this, one of the first decisions that was made was precisely to say, let's end dolphin shows, let's end killer whale shows. We are fully aware of many of the pathologies and uh, problems that animals have because of certain shows that they have to participate in uh, or because of the facilities in which they have to live. Mm, it's also stereotyped and we know that this eventually ends harming the animal and we were not indifferent to this. So. The suggestion was made some time ago, saying let's have an aquatic park, a specific larger dolphin facility to prevent all this. But we questioned the idea. We didn't think that a larger tank would prevent animal suffering. So our decision was very clear. We said we don't want shows with dolphins, but more important, we don't want Barcelona to have dolphins in captivity. And furthermore, not only specifically for dolphins, but we wanted this, this decision to include cetaceans as a whole. Well, I'm sure you've talked about it this morning. It's nothing new. It's not a new movement. What's happening now in the city of Barcelona is not anything exceptional uh, in the world. The UK regulation 20 years ago made sure that delfinariums, delfinaria, had to disappear in Finland. Precisely in the year 2015, they closed down one of the last delfinariums that was still functioning. Poland halted the building of what would have been its first delfinarium. And we have many other examples of cities and countries uh, reinforcing the decisions that we are implementing here in Barcelona. There's a very recent example, France, May 2017, this year. Well, they took some steps in this direction, and they forbade, and this is an issue that's been mentioned internationally. And what did they do? They forbade uh, actually having uh, cetacean calves in captivity. So that meant reproduction had to change. We didn't want reproduction in captivity. That means a full international movement, and it has an impact. It's had an impact, and it still has an impact on our city. It's a really important challenge that we have in front of us. Which are the guidelines that would have to be followed when a city or an organization makes the decision of not having dolphins or cetaceans in captivity? Well, you know better than we do. We need clear criteria that are scientifically based in order to have the best roadmap possible so that we are fully confident and sure that uh, this leads to a good a good goal. And we know that this workshop will help us define these criteria and these guidelines. In this way, you will be helping us, and we will have the foundations for the criteria. So it's a decision that's here. But we have to be very sure that the way we implement this is good as well for the animals. And that depends on you.
So, for us here in Barcelona, it's very important that in the meantime, we continue not only to define our roadmap, uh, something specific and quick, but it goes beyond what we're going to be doing. We want to make sure that these animals that right now are still here in Barcelona are happy wherever they go. So, it's important that we work to guarantee things both uh, short term and long term. We want to follow these animals uh, throughout their lives, and we'll be analyzing the best uh, initiatives. As we said, in 2018, we must have defined the move. We're analyzing all the suggestions. You know that we contacted a number of different cities. Baltimore, for example, was one. We've also been contacting sites in Greece. You've been talking to us. Some of you have suggested other places. But we are exploring the suggestions and ideas that we believe might be best for our decision to see where we move our dolphins. So we eagerly await uh, the results of this workshop and also the work carried out by the other institutions and groups, because that way we will better implement the decision that was made. We want our dolphins to be happy when they are made free. But it's not only this. The Barcelona City Council has many, many things to work on, things that are not only important for Barcelona but elsewhere, and we're going to continue to work on them. There is something that we're working on with Frederic in the Environmental Commission, also with the director of the zoo, and it's the issue of uh, coastline dolphins, those dolphins that swim in the municipal waters. What can we do to follow coastline populations, coastline parts? How can we maintain marine diversity? Because there's much more beyond our shores, and we know that that has to be worked on. And here at Barcelona, we want to help. Obviously, it's not 100 percent the competence of a municipal government, but we do want to be part and parcel of the work that is done for these animals, too. So as I was saying, we the level of expectation is very high regarding this workshop that you're participating in. And as I said at the beginning, I wanted to publicly thank you all. Thank you, those people who have made it possible for us to meet here and who have made it possible to have so much information coming together. It's great that we have you here. For us, it is truly a luxury and an honor to have you here and have you visiting our city. We are delighted with the presentations, with your participation, and I know that this will all be very useful to us to keep on improving and defending the rights of animals with you all and to make this important decision a reality, which will be part of the history of the city of Barcelona as a city for animals. Animal rights. Thank you, and have a great work during the workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. So, time for lunch now. The speakers and volunteers, please, uh, could you stay here and we'll go all together for lunch? And So speakers and volunteers, stay here because we'll go for lunch together and all the other people will meet again at 3 o'clock. Thank you.